Greetings, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is Bob Barbie here. Family, this is the audio version of my book that I wrote back in 2017, The Road to 2024, narrated by Greg Messina of John 316 Productions, the founder and producer of our uptime broadcast that we do every Tuesday. He has done an incredible job narrating this book. So thank you, Brother Greg. And I will also be using pictures that are in the book as thumbnails for this video. So if I was you, just play this book in the background while you're doing work or relaxing at home, drinking coffee, or while you're on the road commuting to work or whatever it is that you are doing. So thank you all for your support throughout the years. And I hope this book greatly blesses you. The Road to 2024, God's Final Declaration Heralding the Seven-Year Tribulation, by Bob Barber. Final Seven Years of Declaration Welcome to what I believe is the most historic time in United States history. It's amazing, however, that most people are oblivious to it. This time in our history will make long-lasting changes in your life, or will mark the end of your life. Are you curious as to why? This book will provide you the answers. Welcome to what God has shown me to be the seven-year last Trump period. What is this period, and when does it take place? That is what this book is all about. This period started in around 2017, and will last through 2024, give or take a year. Judging on when you read this book, you will either be in the middle of this stretch of time, or examining it as a past event. How did this time period come about? Why is it called the last Trump? How do we know it's in effect? How do we know it will end in 2024? You will learn the answers to these questions and a whole lot more in this book. I will provide a lot of exciting biblical teachings that correspond with each section of this time period. Never before have there been such historical alignments with celestial signs, events on earth, and seismic activity below the Earth's surface. For the first time in history, all three categories of signs are simultaneously firing at the same time and at such a rapid speed. These signs point toward a shift for mankind. What will this turning point be? What is going to happen to our planet? Will the world fall under one global government? Is mankind's worst fear about to take place with a potential global extinction? Are we about to witness Jesus Christ's return? Are we about to see the long-awaited resurrection and rapture of the church? Will the biblical seven-year tribulation begin? Will this be the time of God's wrath? Will this seven-year last Trump period usher in an era of world peace? These events and the information in this book have everything to do with you and your family's future. You need to be educated. That is why I wrote this book. I want to educate you about this time we are in right now and how you can prepare for what is coming. President Donald Trump is the centerpiece of this time frame. God has anointed President Trump to be an unstoppable force from 2017 through 2024. Why is that? According to my research, President Trump will serve two terms as President of the United States, no matter what the Democrats, media, celebrities, corporations, globalist leaders, and even the members of his own Republican Party can throw at him. President Trump will continue to be triumphant. That is one of the reasons why God named him Trump. Because the word Trump is in the word triumph. And triumph means victory. His name alone, Trump, means to excel, surpass, outdo. President Trump continues to experience victory after victory, and no one can stop him. His world dominance has never been seen before. This has God's handprint on it. His hand is on President Trump. God raised President Trump to be a non-establishment, powerhouse, billionaire who can't be persuaded by dirty, dark money. Before Trump's presidency, God gave him a celebrity platform to become known worldwide through television and movies. 
God blessed him with the knowledge and favor to become one of the most successful real estate and business owners in the world. God raised him to be a conservative, independent voice with a Christian background, so he could be used as a world leader in the last days. Donald Trump's name is very prophetic. He is the only Donald in the world with the nickname The Donald. When the Donald is broken down, you see something very interesting. Donald is a Scottish Celtic name. It comes from two parts, Dumno, which means world, and Val, which means ruler. The Donald then means the ruler of the world. President Trump is the unofficial ruler of the world because he leads the most powerful and influential nation on earth. God placed him in this position of power and gave him that name for this time frame. God is truly perfect in all his ways. Now let's look at President Trump's last name. Trump is not just found in the words triumph or triumphant, but also in the word trumpet. President Trump's time of power on earth is extremely prophetic to us Christians. Here's why. There is a verse in the Bible that speaks directly to the rapture and resurrection of the dead, which is an event Christians are greatly looking forward to. Special note, every quoted Bible verse in this book is from the King James Version. 1 Corinthians 15, 51-53 states, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. In that verse, you see Trump's name, and the word trumpet. Most of you have heard about this last trump. This refers to the rapture of the church, the catching away. We are called up into the clouds to meet the rest of the resurrected saints in the air. From that point, we shall forever be with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the last trump has great significance with the timing of the resurrection of the rapture. Do you think the phrase, the last trump, mentioned in the Bible deserves a significant amount of research and study to find out exactly what it is and what it means? There are many different layers of interpretation and meanings of every scripture in the Bible. What did the last trump mean to believers 2,000 years ago? And what else can it mean to us today? I'm going to explain the traditional study of the significance of the last trump in this book. Then I'm going to give you a new theoretical view for what the last trump may also mean. I will also explain to you an incredible end time story that has taken place over the last 10 years. There were numerous prophetic celestial signs in the heavens as well as signs on the earth and below its surface which continue to show themselves in an even more accelerated fashion since President Trump came onto the scene in 2016. Please take the time to check out the last Trump timeline charts I have included at the end of this book in the infographic section. These pictures and charts in this section will help you better understand many different topics I will be covering in this book. Isn't it amazing that all these signs are taking place now? And a world leader named Trump has risen up in the midst of them. His presence turns the world upside down in righteousness. God has used a play on words with the names of people, events, timings, and locations when it comes to fulfilling his will on the earth. He is that good and perfect. Could President Trump be the last president and the last Trump before the rapture and resurrection of the church as mentioned in the Bible? All these things combine together to create a gigantic puzzle of the greatest end time sign ever seen. It's a big warning sign that Jesus is returning for his bride and that the biblical seven year tribulation is about to begin. This warning sign is what I call the seven year last Trump awakening period. I will refer to this period throughout this book as the last Trump period. I have studied the Bible cover to cover including extensive studies in many other prophetic books. And since then, I have become an anointed teacher of the Bible. I began making YouTube videos over six years ago. My videos mostly deal with dreams and visions I receive from the Lord and those from people who subscribe to my channel. Outside of the core work, I also make videos 
that teach about the Bible and how it applies to our lives now, as well as the end times. So I have made YouTube videos about this topic, but I cannot put all my research into a 15-minute YouTube video. If I compiled all my research, the video would easily be three hours. The attention span of the average person watching an internet video is only 7 to 15 minutes. So I knew I would eventually have to write a book about this topic. On top of that, there are many other reasons why the Lord led me to write this book. For instance, I received an email from one of my subscribers. She has a son who is in prison. In prison, there is minimal access to computers. She really wanted her son to learn about the last Trump. So she asked me for the manuscript of a specific video I did. I didn't have a manuscript, though. I had notes. But that wouldn't be any benefit to him, because they were just bullet points. When I film a video, I look at those bullet points and say whatever the Holy Spirit leads me to say. There was a whole demographic of people who have not received the warning about the last Trump period simply because they didn't have access to my information. At that point, it occurred to me to write a book. We may not be able to give our imprisoned brothers and sisters in Christ a computer, but we can give them a book. God knows we are in the seven-year last Trump period. What does God do with the United States, which is the most powerful and the most Christian influential nation on the planet? He appoints a leader for a specific time with a certain name. God knows the last Trump time frame should have a righteous world leader whose name matches the time frame. He didn't have to do it this way, but that is one of God's dynamics. He will use a play on words to mark events and time frames on earth. God made it clear in the Bible that the rapture and resurrection will happen at the end of the age. Like I said earlier, the last Trump period is also integrated into this appointed time God has with man. This is the fall feast day of the Jews, called the Feast of Trumpets, which is also known as the Hidden Day, the Coronation of the King, and the Day of Remembrance. All these meanings point to this being a high watch time for the resurrection and the catching away of the church. So, the last Trump period has several layers of meanings to it, and how it is applied in the last days. God appointed Donald Trump as the President of the United States. He also placed him as the unofficial leader of the world. God placed Donald Trump into a position of ultimate world power. President Trump is the centerpiece for God's plans for the whole world to see. We even see a play on words with Trump's Vice President, Mike Pence. The words Trump and Trumpets are the theme of the seven-year last Trump period from 2017 to 2024. In the Bible, we see the words Trump and Trumpet both being used simultaneously in the same message. So, God made another play on words with both Donald Trump and Mike Pence. How many times did you see a sign that said Trump Pence 2016? Say Trump and Pence together quickly. Trump Pence. Trumpets. God even used the name of the Vice President of the United States as a play on words. What are the chances of the last name of the two greatest leaders on earth forming the word trumpets during the last Trump period? Come on, people. God is making this as obvious as possible. These two will be in power for a total of eight years. Trump Pence, Trumpets, will lead the world from 2017 through 2024. Within those eight years is the seven-year last Trump period. What a confirmation it is for their names to mark the leadership of the world during this time frame. So far we have the seven-year last Trump marked by celestial signs. The solar eclipse on August 21, 2017 split America right down the middle. The one-time-only Revelation 12 sign happened on September 23, 2017. A blood moon fell on Israel on July 27, 2018. Then a blood moon fell over America on January 20, 2019. We will have the final eclipse over America on April 8, 2024, to complete the ensemble. The last Trump period kicked off with an eclipse over America. 
Then several prophetic celestial signs took place in the middle of it. The sequence will end with another solar eclipse over America, and it will complete a perfect sequence of celestial activity. This once and forever prophetic celestial sequence takes place from start to finish and is perfectly timed with Trump's presidency. It marks it from beginning to end. When you look at all these things and also consider that the Bible says God appoints and removes all leadership in his perfect timing, that has to make you think, what is God up to with this specific dual leadership of Trump and Pence? God's main purpose for Donald Trump's presidency is to announce the end of the current dispensation of grace and usher in the next, which is the seven-year tribulation dispensation, also known as Daniel's 70th week. God won't present this presidency all by itself, however, without confirming it with signs in the heavens and on earth. God isn't using President Trump to save the world. That is Jesus' job. Instead, God uses President Trump as a trumpet to warn everyone, but especially God's people. God is warning all of us that the time is near for the earth to receive its one true ruling eternal king, Jesus Christ. God uses President Trump as a trumpet, which is done through words he speaks and things he accomplishes. President Trump speaks boldly, and a lot of people don't like him because of that. Do you know who else boldly spoke and wasn't liked because of it? Jesus Christ. When Jesus spoke, his words uncovered the evil works of the Pharisees and scribes. At the same time, his words renewed the minds of the people who followed the Pharisees and scribes. That created division among people. Even Jesus said he had not come to bring peace, but division. Jesus, who is God, is speaking through President Trump right now. God uses Trump's presidency to speak to all nations and to bring the entire earth into the ultimate division of people. God makes it easy for everyone to choose sides. No one can stand in the middle because they must be hot or cold. If they stay in the middle, they are vomited out of God's mouth. We can only choose the left or the right. We have seen this happen in politics, which led to the liberal left and the conservative right. This is a division process that started with President Trump in the last Trump and will continue until the end of the tribulation. This division process will be finalized in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, where the Battle of Armageddon will take place. There the final division will take place with the separation of the goats on his left and the sheep on his right. That will be the end of all division. When President Trump was elected, division accelerated worldwide. That's what I call a worldwide trumpet blast to shake things up. The solar eclipse sign that took place on August 21st also supports this. That eclipse pathway split America right down the middle, which symbolized the splitting of the American people. You know what I find annoying? People who sit in the middle. They don't stand for either side. Instead, they want to be friends with everyone. God doesn't like that either. He wants everyone to be hot or cold. And I agree everyone should be hot or cold for Christ. People who stand in the middle are wishy-washy and boring to hold a conversation with. I can see why Jesus would vomit them out of his mouth. Revelation 3.16 states, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I am driven to share the good news of the Lord's return, and everything that pertains to it. There are two types of workers in God's kingdom. One sows, and the other waters. God anointed me to be the one who waters. God gave me certain gifts through the Holy Spirit. He gave me the gifts of wisdom, knowledge, discernment of spirits, and the ability to teach. Everything I share with you in this book is from the Holy Spirit. I receive great joy in sharing what I learn from God's Word and how it applies to our current lives. We must look for the coming of the Lord so we can go home with Him in the rapture. In heaven, we will wait for the tribulation to be over so 
the earth can have a thousand years of peace with King Jesus as its highest ruler. After the rapture and during the seven-year tribulation, we are all in heaven. Everything I teach now will become instant common knowledge to all of us in heaven. We will all know the truth about all things involving heaven and earth. The Bible states that when we see Jesus, we shall be like him. 1 John 3, 2 states, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We should look like Jesus, and we should know what he knows. That information will be instantaneously unlocked in our minds. Until then, let's take great joy in learning about our Heavenly Father and his great works in heaven and on earth. Perhaps there are some things that we may not understand now, that we will be blessed to continue in our education about our Heavenly Father's vastness for the rest of eternity. I really hope this is the case. I hope God has so much set aside for us to learn. I hope it takes an eternity to grow and become more educated and discover new things about God. Anyway, you're about to learn about the seven-year last trump. This is a very significant time frame. This greatly deserves our attention because it directly affects the time we are in right now, which Jesus warned us about in Matthew chapter 24. The Bible tells us that there will be combinations of signs that will take place right before the seven-year tribulation begins. These will be a combination of celestial signs along with signs on the earth and within the earth, like earthquakes and volcanic activity. I have included pictures and charts in the infographic section at the end of this book, which I made to help you better understand my points throughout this manuscript. Remember, you can also find me at our website, edvforme.org, or on YouTube as Bob Barber, The Last Trump. You will find many videos about this book there. I recommend watching them to review the material again after reading this book. I am still supplying more information in this book than I can in my videos. This information rarely makes it into the next video because I always cover a different topic about the seven-year last trump. It's difficult to tie in leftover information without having the video's message go off track. All that additional information I have usually ends up stored away until I see an opportunity to use it later. This is all guided by the Holy Spirit as well. Yes, I could make another video right away with all the leftover information, but the Holy Spirit usually says no. Then he instructs me to hold on to the information until a later date. We see this all the time with the preachers who deliver a message for a service. He has pages of notes. He is prepared to go through all of them, and then the Holy Spirit leads the preacher in a different direction. When this happens, the message turns out to be incredible. All those unused notes are then filed away. An inspired message usually comes about when someone in the audience is dealing with a specific infirmity. The Holy Spirit will stop a preacher's original message and then lead the preacher through a different message which also might tie into some of the preacher's original notes. Someone will then receive that message with great joy, tears, and happiness. The Holy Spirit knows how to make the proper connections between a teacher and his students. Sometimes you have a preacher who will ignore the Holy Spirit's prompting. The preacher will go on his own direction and get all the way through his notes. He will stand before his congregation at the end of his message with the feeling that he preached the message of the year. At the end, the preacher will only hear a few courtesy claps and some coughs. Just as preachers are susceptible to this, I also need to listen to the Holy Spirit when it comes to the videos I make. I have a whole library of videos that I started with great excitement, but never finished them or never released them. I would finish a video, but the Holy Spirit would tell me that it wasn't the right time to publish it. Or I would begin a video with a lot of speed and excitement. Then, one day, I would stop working on it and never feel led to go back to it. Like I said, 
I have all those videos in my library, and occasionally the Holy Spirit will tell me to pull one up. In this book, I will also share personal testimonies that I have never talked about in my videos, because I need to make videos short and to the point. I don't have a lot of time to talk about myself. I have had many challenges and successes during my walk with God. I believe they will encourage you. Rapture Resurrection DNA Code As Christians, we look for two things to take place in this world. The first is the return of Christ. This event is known as the Rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4.15-17 through 17 states, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We can study the end times all day. But if we're not focusing on why we're experiencing these events, we're missing the whole point. We want to go home to heaven. We want to leave this earth. That is why I am so driven to research biblical end times eschatology. I want to be ready when Jesus returns for his church. I want everyone to be ready and waiting for his return as well. I share on YouTube and even more in this book what the Lord has shown me. The seven-year last trump is probably the most unique and prophetic thing the Holy Spirit has ever shown me. I say this because I am living during this period. The other reason why I say this is because God has been flipping this world upside down. We are beginning to see good triumph over evil. We see nationalism overcoming globalism. We see the greatest division between good and evil in all categories of existence, including politics, culture, race, and all forms of human activities and decency. God is creating this division right now. You must choose a side. I will go further into this time of division later. You are going to learn so much here and be so excited after learning about biblical principles and the seven-year last trump we are currently in. I will share with you a vast amount of information that is aligned with this time frame. My recommendation is for you to read the whole book at least twice. Take notes as you read. It's not that long of a book, and I wrote it this way for a reason. I'm going to keep the information short and sweet, so that you will fully receive it. You will begin to understand the scope of the time frame that we're in, and the possibility of the tribulation beginning during the time frame, or shortly after it. 1 Corinthians 15.52-53 states, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now, let's focus on the first verse above. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. That statement is the pinnacle of my book. Let its words sink in. This verse is the root of why we are in a rapture watch period. After the word trump, there is a colon. Then the scripture continues, For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The phrase, the last trump, has everything to do with our current time. We may soon see the resurrection of the dead and the catching away of the living saints of Jesus Christ. In that verse, we also see the words trump and trumpet. Why does Apostle Paul use both these words? There is a level of mystery here with Paul's word choices. In the prior verse, Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. Is the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the living a mystery? Absolutely. How is God able to resurrect the dead from their graves and combine them with their souls and regenerate the body of the living? It is a mystery. I'm a scientific guy, so I've taken a few runs at this concept, but I still have no idea how it works. 
The good news is that he has done this before, and he will do it again. Remember the time he resurrected an army in front of Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 37, 1-14? How about the time he took Enoch from the earth? He was still alive. Hebrews 11.5 states, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. Then there is a time he took Elijah from the earth. 2 Kings 2.11 states, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Then there are times Jesus resurrected the dead, including Lazarus, and the young man who was resurrected when Jesus was arrested. Mark 14, 51-52 states, And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. You can't forget about all those who were resurrected from the dead at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is also Jesus Christ's own resurrection from the dead, and then rapture into heaven. The same power that did all those works is the same power that exists within you, the believer. I believe there is a resurrection DNA that's imputed into the physical body of every believer at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This new DNA remains undetected until it is activated at the trumpet call of the resurrection and the rapture. You won't see it show up on any scientific test. This DNA is hidden in the mystery of the resurrection and the rapture. This is why our Apostle Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. And he also claims we become a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 states, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This mysterious event takes place within your spirit, soul, and body at the moment you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We believe in Jesus to get into heaven. It's a free gift God has given us. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 states, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You must choose to accept that gift. At that point your body, soul, and spirit go through an instant change that gives you the right to eternal life in heaven with God. You do not have to do any work once you truly believe. By the way, believing is not a work. How many calories do you burn by believing something? None. I do not extend any form of energy from my flesh by believing in something. Salvation is truly a gift from God. You have guaranteed salvation in heaven. Your soul and spirit are sealed from any damage your flesh can cause them. Ephesians 4.30-32 through 32 states, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Your body, on the other hand, is not redeemed yet. It's marked for God, but he hasn't taken ownership. That's why your body still dies. But your soul and spirit go to heaven. It's also why you have a conscience that is against committing sins after the experience. The Bible says our spirit wars with our flesh. Galatians 5.17 states, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Instead, you become remorseful of any sin committed in the flesh. The Holy Spirit dwells within you and grieves every time you sin, your soul and spirit fully belonging to God. That work is finished, never to be undone. You are secured in the Father's hand. When you die, your soul and spirit go to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8 states, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The word absent means to eventually return. It's like being absent from school. Your body is purchased for the day of redemption, but it has not been redeemed yet. It's like receiving the winning lottery ticket. The prize money is yours, but you haven't redeemed it yet. 
Jesus told us that he's coming back to redeem his prize. He told us that when we shall see these things come to pass, we should look up because our redemption is close. In Revelation 5.9, we also see those whom he redeems from the earth. Revelation 5.9 states, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou hast been slain, and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. People are standing in heaven before his throne. They are not on earth. There is a regeneration process of your body, soul, and spirit at the moment the Holy Spirit enters your body and sanctifies it. Unless this happens, you will not go to heaven. You will end up in hell no matter how good you were or the amount of good deeds you did. There is no amount of good deeds or sacrifices you can do to achieve that level of heavenly righteousness. Heaven must give you that gift. The Holy Spirit must give you your gift of redemption. If you want this gift, all you have to do is have faith in it. If you feel led to God to receive this gift, there is good news. He is already in the process of drawing you in to receive it. God must draw you in first before you feel the desire in your heart to go to him. This means he provides your gift of salvation through Jesus, his only son. He waits for you before you even know to ask for it. Jesus also said he would never turn anyone away who comes to him for salvation. I love that the Bible says that God cannot lie. Numbers 23.19 states, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? That means Jesus won't turn you away if you go to him, no matter how bad you are. If you go to him, you will receive guaranteed salvation. The only thing that disqualifies you is if you receive the mark of the beast or blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. The mark of the beast is a mark in your right hand or forehead that identifies you with the beast system. This mark will be specifically designed to enable you to participate in commerce on earth. Revelation 13:16 through 18 states, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is impossible for us to unknowingly commit. When Jesus walked the earth, whoever claimed he had a demon operating in him, instead of the Holy Spirit, committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12:31 through 32 states, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Because God is not walking the earth right now, you won't be able to do that. So don't worry if you committed this sin without knowing. Trust me, if you did, you certainly would not be seeking redemption through Jesus, because God would not be drawing you unto him. Remember, God can never lie. If he draws anyone who has committed either of these two sins, or both, then that would mean he contradicts himself. God would be a liar. His holy word stands true forever. He can never lie. So if he is drawing you to him, or if you are already currently walking with him, then you did not commit either of those two sins. The Holy Spirit has entered your body and brought your dead spirit to life. Paul said we are spiritually dead before receiving Christ. Ephesians 2.5 states, Even when we are dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. According to Jesus, our body and spirit must be reborn to enter heaven. John 3.3 3 states, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Matthew 18, 3 states, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Our spirit is reborn of heaven at the moment of belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ as our only way to heaven. Then our physical body will be reborn at the resurrection and the rapture. God is three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God said, Let us make them in our image. This means we also have three parts, body, soul, and spirit. You must understand this very important point. This can only happen if you are alive on earth. You cannot be reborn after you are dead. Your soul and spirit are separated from your physical body when you die. In order for your soul and spirit to be born again, your body, soul, and spirit must be together at the point of the union with the Holy Spirit your soul and spirit are within their temple, your body. These three entities must be together on earth. Your soul and spirit cannot regenerate if they are outside the walls of your body. All three of your entities must be present in one place to receive this eternal gift. That place, according to God's law, is within your body. When your spirit is regenerated, it automatically touches your soul and body. Your spirit is regenerated to be like Christ, and your body is now marked for the resurrection and the rapture. The regeneration process starts with your spirit and then touches your soul and body. Here is the problem of repenting for your sins and asking for Jesus to come into your life after you die. The Holy Spirit will not come into your spirit in hell to regenerate it and then afterward travel to your tomb and touch your lifeless body there. All three must be present and connected to each other to receive the gift of salvation. When you are born again, your spirit and soul go to heaven after you die. Your body remains on the earth and is marked with the same righteous element as your soul and spirit in heaven. That happens because of your union with the Holy Spirit that took place while you were alive. Your body or ashes then wait for the Lord to return. Your body will not be like it was before you died. It will be a glorified and heavenly capable body. Your glorified soul and spirit will enter your heavenly capable body. This is the resurrection that takes place right before the rapture. Your three parts become complete and you go to heaven. The Bible even addresses these completed beings in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12.23 states, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect. This is why you cannot be saved after you die. Your three beings are separated. Your body is the temple of your soul and spirit. In the Old Testament, sins were forgiven at the temple. The Spirit of God entered the temple after it was built. 1 Corinthians 16.9 states, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not of your own? He was inside the temple ark, receiving blood sacrifices for the remission of sins. Remission is temporary. God rolled sins over, but never forgot them. It wasn't until Jesus' final blood sacrifice that we received permanent forgiveness of our sins. Right after Jesus died, the Holy Spirit left the second temple, tearing the veil in half. His work there was finished. The second temple was no longer needed. The Holy Spirit returned on Pentecost to begin baptizing our spirit by entering and dwelling within the temple of the human body. Our bodies are the only temple that can receive God's Spirit. The Bible says that God's Spirit is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12.29 states, For our God is a consuming fire. Fire plays a big role in our regeneration process. Fire permanently destroys anything it touches, and it also is used as a purification process as well. The fire of God permanently destroys our sin and purifies our spirit. John the Baptist said that Jesus would baptize us with fire. Tongues of fire appeared over the heads of the 120 in the upper room at Pentecost. The regenerating power of the indwelling Holy Spirit destroys the old you and creates the new you. What is rebirth? Jesus said we must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. God is made up of three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
God made us in His image, so we are made of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. The temple was also divided into three parts, the outer court, inner court, and the holy of holies. The outer court is a representation of our outer body, or flesh. The inner court represents our soul, which is our consciousness. The holy of holies represents our redeemed spirit, which is where the Holy Spirit resides within us. All three of our parts must be redeemed for us to legally exist in the kingdom of heaven. All three parts of God are pure, and the Bible says nothing impure will ever enter the kingdom of heaven. Revelation 21.27 states, And there shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The Bible says when we see Jesus we shall be like him. This only happens at the rapture and resurrection of his saints. What happens to the body, soul, and spirit when someone receives Jesus as their Savior? The soul and spirit are instantly regenerated to full, righteous capacity of the pureness of God. Your soul and spirit are sealed to the day of redemption, which is the resurrection and rapture day. Then your body is marked with God's supernatural spiritual DNA that will activate on that faithful day. This way, your physical body is now compatible with your purified soul and spirit to exist together as one holy being in God. In order to live for eternity with God, you must have a redeemed body, soul, and spirit. You will be three in one just like God. If you die before that can take place, your soul and spirit won't have a temple to receive the Holy Spirit in. The Holy Spirit can't redeem your soul and spirit on Judgment Day and go down to earth to redeem your corpse. It doesn't work that way. All three of your parts must be connected for this to happen. How can you invite a friend into your house you no longer live in? It's kind of like that. In eternity, your soul and spirit live in your body. You can't have eternal life without it. In order for you and your body to exist in heaven, both must be regenerated while on earth. That is why the resurrection and rapture will take place on earth, not in heaven. It's up to you to invite the Holy Spirit into your heart in order to sanctify all three parts. If you don't, you will go to hell. An unredeemed body after death is a complete castaway. An unredeemed soul and spirit after permanent separation from the body is a complete castaway, because nothing unclean can enter heaven. There's only one place for all unclean things to go. Hell. Eventually, the final destination is far worse. The lake of fire. That will be the permanent place for anything unclean. If you don't want to be separated from God, you must become a child of God. Receive his eternal seed of the Holy Spirit and be born again as a young child. Jesus said that none may enter the kingdom of heaven unless they become like a young child. Matthew 18, 3. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. He's referring to the dead in Christ who are sleeping. Throughout the Bible, we see the word sleeping used in place of the word dead. Paul said we shall not all sleep, which means we shall not all be dead at the time of the resurrection and the rapture. Then he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. What is this moment or this twinkling of an eye? The first interpretation is the speed at which the rapture takes place. So many people get this but also miss it. How fast was the transformation of our soul and spirit into the righteousness of Christ at the moment we believed in him? Instantaneous. It happened in the twinkling of an eye. The Bible tells us we must believe in our hearts and confess with our tongues that we believe in Jesus Christ. Romans 10.9 states that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I'm here to tell you that by the time you confess with your tongue that Jesus is Lord, your soul and spirit have already been redeemed and sealed to the day of redemption. The DNA in your body has already received the resurrection DNA insertion. Then you wait for your body to be glorified at the rapture and resurrection. 
The moment you believe in Jesus and his finished work at the cross for your salvation, God then gives you his gift of faith. This gift transforms your soul and spirit, and only at this point you are renewed. As a result of all of this, you will be able to utter the words of your belief in Jesus and repent for your sins. The whole belief and transformation process is instantaneous. This belief must manifest in your heart before you will utter a single word of repentance and belief in Jesus. The words you speak now will be the end results of what happened inside of you. Your words and actions are simply manifestations of the regeneration process that just took place within you. You must believe something in your heart before you can speak of it. When we see a person get saved, there is always a moment of silence before they verbally proclaim their faith in Jesus. Whether it's a split second or listening to a half hour of preaching, regardless of how long it takes for someone to go from a non-believer to a believer, when they first hear the message of the gospel, the result in the end is the same. You will be able to sincerely proclaim Jesus is the Son of God. You will be able to claim salvation by believing in Him. Many people ask God to come into their hearts, but He's already there. God is not bound by time. The moment of belief is the trigger point of where this work of the Holy Spirit takes place within us. You will believe in your heart before you say anything. Like I said, the Bible says if a person believes in his heart and confesses with his tongue, he shall be saved. Jesus did all the work at the cross. Why would he also not do the work within you from start to finish without having you do a single thing? A gift is a gift. Believing is not work. All God asks is that you believe. Every time Jesus became angry with the apostles was because they did not believe. Believing in things of the spiritual realm, while in the natural realm, was everything to Jesus. You can lay on the couch and believe in things all day long and not burn a single calorie doing so. Yet we burn calories when we speak. In the moment we believe we are given the gift of faith, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. There is an inkling of belief within us that is just enough to invite the Holy Spirit in. There the Holy Spirit supplies the rest of the belief, which is the gift of faith, and the regeneration process completes itself. Once the process is complete, you will proclaim that Jesus is your Savior. Without the gift of faith, you will not have the belief in your heart to bring yourself to sincerely say that you truly accept Jesus into your life. Most Christians believe that someone must verbally say a salvation prayer and then the Holy Spirit enters his or her body and does his work. They believe they must summon the Holy Spirit to hear this salvation prayer spoken before he does anything for the unsaved human. This is the furthest thing from the truth of what actually happens in the spiritual realm. It is not the salvation prayer spoken by the person getting saved that prompts the Holy Spirit to enter their body but rather the moment of belief in Jesus and his finished work of salvation at the cross. The moment someone believes in their mind and heart in the saving grace of Jesus is when he or she is saved. Then they will confirm it by speaking with their tongue about their newfound belief. Apostle Paul said we must believe and confess with our tongue and we shall be saved. When your spirit is regenerated in Christ, the Holy Spirit fills you with his living water. Then this living water will begin to flow out of you as spoken words. This living water is words we speak on behalf of the glory of God. The Bible says that Jesus is this unique water. John 4.14 4 states, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 7.38 states, He that believeth in me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. How can this living water flow out of you if it wasn't put there in the first place by the Holy Spirit? It's the regeneration of your soul and spirit and marking your body with the Holy Spirit undetected spiritual DNA for the day of redemption. This DNA in your body can't be seen in the physical world, but rather in the spiritual the proclamation of your faith in Jesus will flow out of you like living water. This water can't flow out of your belly until it's placed in your belly. 
When I say belly, I mean your spiritual core. This isn't physical water placed in your stomach, but rather a spiritual filling place in the core of your being. The Holy Spirit is within you. He is your core. Yes, you're sinful on the outside, but your core is pure and beautiful on the inside. It will stay this way until the day of redemption because your core is sealed. Your core is your soul and spirit. The gift of faith only comes through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must enter you and complete His work before you can proclaim Jesus as your Savior. I know there is a fine line between people who say they accept Jesus just to get somebody off their back and those who truly believe. Paul said that he who proclaims with his mouth and believes in his heart shall be saved. Anyone can pray a salvation prayer or say they believe in Jesus, but if they don't mean it, they can still be condemned to hell. Jesus said no one can go to the Father unless he draws them in. John 6, 44 states, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. God may not even draw someone close, even if you are trying to lead them to prayer and repentance. Your desire to see that person saved will be in vain. It's like trying to bring a man and woman together as a couple without their consent. There is a gray area in trying to get people to say a salvation prayer. If he or she won't believe, they will not be saved. I have seen people say the prayer of salvation and then never live for God. I believe I have witnessed this firsthand, like one time when I met up with a friend from high school. After connecting with him, I led him through the salvation prayer and he repeated it. Since then, I have been in contact with him by phone and have occasionally seen him. From what I've seen, he doesn't live for the Lord or speak about him. Was he truly saved, or did I plant a seed that will be watered at an appointed time? I don't know. The Bible tells us we all must work out our salvation with God in fear and trembling. Philippians 2.12 states, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Once you receive the message of the gospel, what happens next is up to you. What happened to the seed that fell upon him? What kind of soil was he? Here's a revelation for you. Our bodies are made in the soil of the earth. This is true with the creation of Adam in Genesis. Isn't it interesting that we are made of dirt and there is a seed that falls upon us? The seed is the word of God that comes to your body and tries to enter your body and regenerate your spirit. It's like we are walking piles of dirt. Scientists have proven that every element of our body is also found in the earth soil. In the book of Genesis, God creates our body from the soil of the earth. Genesis 2.7 states, And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The Last Trump Mystery We have established rapture and resurrection in this book, so we shall move on to specifics of what the seven-year Trump is. This seven-year period is from the years 2017 through 2024. That is what the Holy Spirit showed me to be the last Trump period. Within this time frame, there are a plethora of celestial signs as well as activities on and below the earth. This time frame will have more signs and wonders than any other time frame in history. This time frame has the highest concentration of rapture and tribulation activity as well. This seven-year period comprises a greater number of signs than we've probably seen within the last 100 years. These signs are definitive signals that the rapture is about to happen and the seven-year tribulation will begin. I will not be able to list every single thing that has happened because there is so much coming out. There are endless signs and indicators. No one on earth can possibly track them all. Many of these signs are not reported by any news agency or alternative outlet. There is simply too much going on. Unfortunately, mainstream media is no help. That is what is so great about the church. There are millions of members in this body who can divide up the work. There are so many Christians with YouTube channels reporting on end-time events, including me. 
Each one of us has been given a specific set of information to report to the masses. I interpret dreams, visions, and a select amount of teachings the Holy Spirit has commissioned me to present. The greatest message I have received from the Holy Spirit about the end times is the seven-year last trump period. Those of you who have done your homework in the past will know about the last trump that is blown once a year at the Feast of Trumpets. If you don't know what this is, the Feast of Trumpets is one of the seven appointed times on God's calendar with mankind. These are also known as Jewish feast days. Israelites have been celebrating these feast days since the first Passover. That is when Moses and the Israelites left Egypt more than 3,500 years ago. Here are the seven appointed times. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, Tabernacles. Each of these days has its own ritual, which the Jews practiced every year. These rituals and their meanings became ingrained in the minds and hearts of the Jews. God told them through prophets and scriptures that these feast days would eventually be fulfilled. At the Feast of Passover, they sacrificed lambs for the remission of sins. Jesus died on the cross at Passover as the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Jews baked and ate bread without any leaven in it. Leaven is yeast, which represents sin. Jesus is the bread of life that entered the oven, which is Sheol, or hell, in the center of the earth, without any sin. The Feast of First Fruits is when the high priest went to a barley field and marked off a small section of about three feet by three feet. He then cut it down and took it to the temple. He waved it before God as an offering so God would bless the rest of that harvest. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day unto eternal life, along with all the Old Testament saints who came out of the graves with him. Collectively, they all eventually ascended into heaven and stood before God. Jesus, who is our high priest, presented the resurrected saints along with himself as the first fruits of eternal life before God. Then God blessed the rest of the harvest, which is everyone alive at the time and who will be born into this world until the end of the seven-year tribulation. God first collects the first fruits, then main harvest, and finally the gleanings in the four corners of the field. The first fruits is our resurrected Savior Jesus Christ, along with the resurrected saints who came out of their graves at the same time. 1 Corinthians 15.20 states, But now is Christ risen from the dead the first fruits of them that slept. The main harvest is the entire church that will be resurrected and raptured at the end of this current dispensation of grace. The gleanings of the four corners are all the Jewish elect dead and alive who are gathered from heaven and the four corners of the earth. They are all brought to Jerusalem at the end of the dispensation of the seven-year tribulation. Matthew 24:31 states, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Then the Feast of Pentecost is celebrated fifty days after Passover. The feast was finally fulfilled when the Holy Spirit arrived in Jerusalem fifty days after Passover. The Holy Spirit arrived in the upper room, where the apostles and many other believers were. One hundred and twenty people were in the room. The Holy Spirit fell on them as tongues of fire and gave them his power of regeneration. At that point, they spoke in other tongues, and all those who heard them in Jerusalem marveled because they heard them speak in his or her own native language. The church was conceived in the womb of Israel on that day. Now the church is about to be born again at the rapture and resurrection. When that happens, the dispensation of the Age of Grace will end because that dispensation is only to build and complete the Church, or the Bride of Christ. After this dispensation ends, the seven-year tribulation will begin. It will be a brand new dispensation with a new set of rules for salvation and more. The Feast of Trumpets is the next feast day on God's calendar. It always takes place in the fall during the months of September and October. The Feast of Trumpets is meant to get Israel ready to receive her king. The feast day is unique because it's a two-day celebration. It's also called the Hidden Day because no one knows the day or hour when it begins. It's based off the lunar cycles and the high priest's ability to see the sliver of the new moon. Clouds can be an issue. 
Once the new moon is found, the high priest announces to the nation that the feast begins. Because they didn't have telephones back then, they spread the word by lighting fires on top of mountains. Imagine being in a community far from Jerusalem. You probably wouldn't receive the message of the feast until a day later. It truly was the hidden day. It is interesting that Jesus said no man would know the day or hour of his return. Is the Feast of Trumpets a clue to when the rapture might take place? During this appointed time, many trumpets will blow as a warning to repent for sins and get right with God. It's also a time when the Jews believe the resurrection of the dead can take place. That was initiated with the final trumpet blast of the celebration of the last trump. There are four different trumpets blown during the feast. Teruah, Shevarim, Takia, Takia Hadgalah. The first three trumpets are each blown 33 times. Each trumpet has its own unique sound. Those first 99 blasts are short and quick. The Takia Hadgalah, which is the final trumpet blast, is only blown once. Unlike the others, this one blast is super long. A high priest took one deep breath and would blow the trumpet until he ran out of air. That is the last trump. That trumpet marks the end of the Feast of Trumpets in Israel. It's also the trumpet the Druze believe will initiate the resurrection of the dead and the rapture. Evidently, the Feast of Trumpets is a high watch time for the resurrection and the rapture. This feast day, unlike the first four feast days in spring, has not yet been fulfilled. Many believe this day will take place when Jesus resurrects the dead and raptures the living on earth. We say this for two reasons. The main two rapture verses in the Bible have the dominant essence of trumpets in them. They are 1 Thessalonians 4.15-17 through 17 and 1 Corinthians 15.51-53. There are many other parallels that show the Feast of Trumpets makes a great candidate for the time of resurrection and rapture. There are so many great studies on this topic. I alone have done many videos on this topic. The main thing I want you to take away from this book is the last trump mentioned in the verse above. No other place in scripture gives us an exact time of when the rapture and resurrection will take place. The Bible gives us many signs that point toward a particular season, which is where we are now. What's unique about 1 Corinthians 1551 51-53 is that Paul says the resurrection will take place followed by the rapture, at the last trump. That said, I believe the last trump deserves the maximum amount of research and interpretation. The Bible tells us how we should build doctrine and study scripture by rightly dividing the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 states, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Isaiah 28.10 states, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. The final two appointed times on God's calendar are atonement and tabernacles. The Day of Atonement is the holiest day of the year in Judaism. Its central themes are atonement and repentance. Jewish people traditionally observe this holy day with a 25-hour period of fasting and intensive prayer. They often spend most of the day in a synagogue. The Day of Atonement takes place on the 10th day of the 7th month on the Hebrew calendar. On this day, people also ask God to forgive their sins. The day is very important because it's when God decides whether to end everything and begin the tribulation. Jewish people who truly practice Judaism are on the edge of Yom Kippur, what is known as the Day of Atonement. God sees people who regularly repent. He also sees people who repent a little here and there. He observes those who don't repent at all. Depending on the number of Jews repenting, God might decide to end it all and begin the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel's 70th week, which is known as the seven-year tribulation. The beginning of the seven-year tribulation can be one of the fulfillments of the Day of Atonement. Another fulfillment will be when Jesus returns to the earth and separates the sheep from the goats. Notice how that judgment is the separation of religious people. It seems the Day of Atonement mostly affects the Jewish people. 
They have practiced feast days long before Gentiles heard about them and began to apply them. The feast days all point to Jesus Christ. We have a different dynamic in our lives compared to Orthodox Jews. We are saved by grace in our faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work at the cross. Orthodox Jews don't believe this, so they continue to look at the Day of Atonement and its ancient context as a day of the great decision of God. If the rapture happens during the Feast of Trumpets, it's safe to say that Jacob's trouble could begin on the Day of Atonement, ten days later. There are ten days of repentance that separate the two feasts, and God gave ten commandments. After all, the seven-year tribulation is when God turns his attention directly toward Israel's Orthodox Jews and brings them back into the fold. That is why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 37 Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7 states, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jacob, the descendant of Abraham and Isaac, was renamed Israel. Genesis 32:28 states, And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. All Jews today are descendants of Jacob. All Jews on earth are corporately known as present-day Israel, a.k.a. Jacob. Israel isn't just a country in the Middle East, but also a nation of people known as the Jews. God told this to Rebekah, who gave birth to Jacob, and his twin brother Esau, thousands of years ago. Genesis 25:23 states, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. Why is it called the time of Jacob's trouble? Jacob is corporate Israel today, and the seven-year tribulation is a time frame that God deals directly with Israel. In a nutshell, the whole world comes against Israel, and God will defend them. Zechariah 12.3 states, And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. The seventh and final feast day is called Tabernacles, which is commonly translated as Festival of Tabernacles. This is the festival of ingathering. It's a biblical Jewish holiday celebrated on the 15th day of the seventh month, also known in Hebrew as Tishri. During that time, Jewish people will live in tents outside of their homes. Because the word tabernacle means tent, it's a reminder of their time in the wilderness when they were living in tents. This serves as a reminder of how God took care of them in the desert for 40 years after leaving Egypt with Moses and Aaron. Tabernacles also represent the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. This is when he comes down to earth and dwells with men for 1,000 years. So this regeneration of our bodies has a great probability of happening during the seven-year last trump. The key phrase we're looking for during the end days is the last trump. Paul said the words trump and trumpet when he was talking about the resurrection and the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15.52 states, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. With such an important future event, it begs the question, what is the last trump? Is it Tekia Hadgala blown in Israel? Is the Tekia Hadgala the name of a certain trumpet blast through a shofar at the end of the Feast of Trumpets like we have all been taught? This trumpet is also known as the last trump. Jewish people believe when the trumpet sounds it will initiate the resurrection of the dead. Is that it? Or can it also have a deeper prophetic meaning? The Holy Spirit has shown me this revelation in my research. When we see the words, the last trump, we should also consider these words to mean these things as well. The last trump, the last call to repentance, the last warning of his coming judgment, the last word before his judgment, 
the last chance before his judgment, the last days before his judgment, the last events before his judgment, the last declaration of his coming judgment. This judgment I'm referring to in this list is the seven-year tribulation, or the day of the Lord, Daniel's 70th week. So, the last trump is ultimately defined as this. It's a short time frame marked by God as a warning to mankind that one dispensation will end and a new one will begin. This time frame is from 2017 until 2024. God marks the final days, months, or years at the end of a dispensation by filling them with an abundant number of signs in the heavens and on earth. We are currently in the Age of Grace. This is also known as the Ecclesiastical or Church Age. This age is about to come to an end, and a new age will begin. By observing what's happening during the last trump, it's easy to see that we are in the final mile of this dispensation of time that began almost 2,000 years ago. Many don't believe there are dispensations. If that's you, I'm here to say you haven't studied the Bible all the way through. Ephesians 1.10 states, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. I would also like you to look at this graph I made that divides the Bible up into eight dispensations of time before we go into eternity. You will see that we are in the sixth dispensation of time. Here are the eight dispensations of time before we go into eternity. The Edenic Age the creation of the world to the fall of Adam. Antediluvian age, the fall of Adam through the flood of Noah. Human government age, the flood of Noah to the fall of the Tower of Babel. The patriarch age, days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, days of Moses, and the exodus of Israel out of Egypt. Legal age, from the exodus of Egypt to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Ecclesiastical age, this is the age that we are in right now. This is also known as the Age of Grace or the Church Age. This age started at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the first baptism of the Holy Spirit in the upper room in Jerusalem. This age will end at the rapture and resurrection of all who have been baptized by the Holy Spirit, both the living and the dead. Seven-Year Tribulation Age. This is known as the Day of the Lord or the Day of His Wrath. Daniel's 70th week. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. God is purifying the earth to receive its king, Jesus Christ. Millennial reign age. This is the final age of peace where Jesus Christ reigns on the earth for 1,000 years. This is the coming kingdom of God that Jesus preached about to the Jews throughout all four Gospels. This is a new beginning on earth. It's fitting because the number eight means new beginnings. All the signs we are seeing prior to and during the last trump are signals that God is getting ready to bring this current dispensation age to a close. This means the seven-year tribulation will begin soon. We see the signs in the heavens in the graph I share in this book. As far as the signs on earth, it's an absolute sea of prophetic activity. If you want a list of these activities, read Matthew chapter 24. When you are done reading, you will agree with me that everything Jesus mentioned is happening at an accelerated rate. One of the biggest signals for me is government's lawlessness around the world, especially in the United States. The U.S. government is one of the worst in the world. We have the conservative right, which is good, and the liberal left, which is the worst. The divide that separates these two sides has grown to its greatest distance ever since President Trump was elected. This beginning of the time of great division was marked by an American eclipse on August 21, 2017. The eclipse was symbolic because it traveled right down the middle of America, dividing the country in two. The Bible said that would happen right before an age ends. This series of eclipses indicates we are at the end of the age of grace. Joel 2.31 states, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Genesis 1.14 states, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, 
and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. God made those celestial bodies for us to admire from afar. They announce how incredible of a creator he is and the vastness of his glory. God also uses them as a communication tool to mark and announce the times when he makes prophetic moves. In 2014 to 2015, we observed the blood moon tetrad. That is when a blood moon manifests on four Jewish feast days, which are also appointed times God made with man. Blood moon on Passover, which was April 15th, 2014. Blood moon on Tabernacles, October 8th, 2014. Blood moon on Passover, April 4th, 2015. Blood moon on Tabernacles, September 28th, 2015. Before I go any further with the signs that manifest during this time, I want to give you a brief history on the blood moon tetrad. A blood moon has always served as a warning to Israel, and it's not always a bad warning. Throughout history, God has marked prophetic events for Israel by a blood moon tetrad. Here are the blood moon tetrads and the significant events they appeared around. 0 AD, birth of Jesus Christ. 33 AD, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 70 AD, destruction of the city of Jerusalem. 666 AD, birth of the satanic cult of Islam. 1493 to 1494 AD, Jews expelled from Spain and birth of the new Western world. The new world became known as the United States, which was used as a safe haven for the Jews for the next 500 years. Today, the United States is the number one ally for Israel. 1949 to 1950 AD, Israel is rebirthed as an official nation. 1967 to 1968 AD, Israel regains their capital city, Jerusalem, during the Six-Day War. 2014 to 2015 AD, Jerusalem declared the capital of Israel. The rise and fall of Muslims armies of ISIS took place during this blood moon tetrad. The Bethlehem star returned after more than 2,000 years. This specific tetrad announced the coming of the seven-year last trump. It announced all events prior, during, and after this awakening period. Because this is the eighth blood moon tetrad, I believe it marks a new beginning. The number eight is the biblical number signaling a new beginning. This beginning is the millennial reign that comes as a result of all the events I mentioned above. The millennial reign is the eighth dispensation in time as well. Are you starting to see the parallels? The blood moon that just took place compares to all the other tetrads throughout history. A solar eclipse appeared in the midst of one on March 20th, 2015. March 20th is the first day of the year on the Jewish calendar. Solar eclipses serve as warnings to the Gentile nations, while blood moons are warnings to Israel. Because the solar eclipse took place on a Jewish feast day, that means God's dealings with Israel are going to impact the entire world. During these prophetic celestial arrangements, another addition took place to complete the ensemble. The Bethlehem star revealed itself on June 30th, 2015. Jesus is the only religious figure to have his earthly activities, including his death, marked by heavenly signs. The star's reappearance happened in the midst of a very prophetic arrangement of celestial signs. All these signs were clustered together during a three-year period. The number three means divinity, perfection, and finished that is lesser to the number of seven. This is why the celestial arrangement took place before the seven-year period before the last trump, a period of three years followed by a period of seven years. With the number three, we can go on for quite some time. Jesus was in the belly of the earth for three days before he was resurrected. He was 33 years old when he accomplished his work on earth. It's extremely prophetic that these signs are encompassed within a three-year period. Now we must ask ourselves what the arrangement of signs was proclaiming. Was it marking specific events taking place on earth? Was it marking something that is going to happen after these signs are completed? Yes. We used to believe the celestial arrangement identified the time of the tribulation. 
Everyone believed the tribulation would begin with the rapture in September 2013, and the tribulation would end in 2020. As time went on, we realized these signs were not making the actual dispensation of the tribulation, even though many wars and rumors of wars took place during the three-year period. Let's first mention the worst deal in the history of the world. The Iranian nuclear deal. Every American should be immensely upset about this. A big portion of our hard-earned money went toward building Iran's nuclear interest industry so they could begin building their own nuclear weapons. These are the same people who were hell-bent on destroying America and Israel. During that time, we also saw the rise of ISIS. It was a proxy army created by President Obama and his administration, along with others, including Hillary Clinton, the Vatican, the late John McCain, and others. The army's main purpose was to destabilize the Middle East. With that, a wave of lawlessness arose across the Middle East. Innocent Jewish, Christian, and Muslim people were killed. ISIS killed more Muslims than anyone else. It's strange to say because ISIS is made up of Muslims. The hellbound army was stopped immediately after President Trump was elected. That was another mark identified by the celestial arrangement. President Trump took office January 2017. During that three-year period, we also saw Benjamin Netanyahu elected for another term as Prime Minister of Israel. John 1.14 states, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Understand this, we don't see Jesus begin his ministry until he became an adult. How much time will pass before the second arrival of Jesus Christ? Later, I will cover more about the Bethlehem star and its connection to the Revelation 12 celestial sign that took place on September 23, 2017. Here is one revelation I received. According to my chart, the celestial arrangement that took place from 2014 through 2016 announced the coming of the seven-year Trump period. It's no surprise that these two segments of time form a ten-year time frame we see there is a time segment of three years and then a segment of seven years, which totals ten years. I call the first three-year segment the Divinity Celestial Sign Arrangement. It was divided into three celestial participants, the Sun, Moon, and the Bethlehem Star, all spread out over three years. Planets are also considered stars and constellations. The Bethlehem star is a combination of Venus and Jupiter. Jupiter represents the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Jupiter is covered in stripes. Jesus took stripes on his back when he was scourged. There is a big red spot on Jupiter that represents when they pierced Jesus after he died on the cross. Venus represents the Bride of Christ and Jesus as well. This is fitting because he is our headship in our marriage to him. And when we are one in him, just like I'm the headship of my wife and she is known by my last name, so when the two planets come together, they create a beautiful, far brighter light that could be easily seen from the Earth, known as the Bethlehem Star, or star alignment if you want to get technical. When these two become one, they represent two things. The Bethlehem Star represents marriage. The Bible says that man and woman will become one flesh. Genesis 2.20 states, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. When a man and woman come together in marriage, they become far greater than they were when they were separate. The combined light from Jupiter and Venus overlapping each other was far greater than the light they generated by themselves. The Bethlehem star is also the sign of new life. When the husband joins with his wife, New life can be created through sexual intercourse. Jupiter joins with Venus and creates a new light, just like when the seed of a man enters the egg of a woman in her womb. There is an instant flash of light when these two combine. It makes sense why God would use the Bethlehem star over 2,000 years ago as a sign that new life was coming into the world. That new life was Jesus Christ. Does the Bethlehem star in 2015 represent Jesus' birth as a baby? No. The reappearance of the Bethlehem star represents a new birth about to take place. 
This birth represents resurrection and the rapture of the church. The church was conceived over 2,000 years ago, and when the seed of the Holy Spirit entered the womb of Israel in the upper room. This event represents the conception of the man-child spoken of in the Bible in Revelation 12. Israel is our mother, according to Apostle Paul. Galatians 4.26 states, But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. The Holy Spirit baptized the first 120 members of the church with fire. They were Jewish followers of Jesus. Since then, the church has been growing in the womb of Israel for the last 2,000 years and is about to be born. Understand the parallel when Paul talked about how every member of the body has his own job to do. He didn't say bodies. The body we all exist in is the body of Christ. Jesus said we will be hated for his name's sake. Matthew 10.22 states, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. The world hated Jesus, who represents the head of the church. If the world hates the head of the church, then they certainly will hate his body, which represents us. Revelation 12.5 states, And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Sounds like a governing body to me. The birth represents the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the living, who are represented in the body of Christ. That means every human in the body needs to be reborn. Jesus said no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born of the body and of the spirit. Jesus said no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born of the body and spirit. So at the resurrection and the rapture, every one of us in his church, whether dead or alive, is brought to Jesus' level of perfection. The Bible says when we see him, we shall be like him. Our soul and spirit are already like him because those parts were redeemed and sealed. Our body is the last part that must be redeemed to become the completed eternal being for life with God. At the rapture and resurrection, God brings us up to the level of perfection in Christ while simultaneously bringing up the entire body of Christ to his level of perfection. In fact, until the birth of Jesus, that sign never took place again in history. So, it's safe to say that the Bethlehem star is an extremely important sign heralding that Jesus is coming onto the scene soon. Just that sign by itself would have been enough. Yet God displays even more signs to announce the coming of many things. I believe he also gave us these signs to help us recognize the season of the resurrection and the rapture. He loves us so much that he is going to do that for us. Donald Trump also announced his run for presidency during the three-year period. His message was completely different than all the other presidential candidates and probably different than any presidential candidate ever in the United States elections. President Trump spoke out against abortion and how he was going to dismantle the practice of abortion in the United States. Abortion is a worship unto demons. Moloch and Baal in the Bible. When Trump announced his run for candidacy, the temple of Baal fell in the Middle East. The stone temple had been standing strong for over 2,000 years. Then, all of a sudden, it fell apart, leaving only the entrance. The Last Trump Celestial Sequence Up to this point, we have covered the first portion of celestial activity of the period from 2014 to 2024. There were enough signs to tell the world that Jesus would soon return in the years 2014 through 2016 alone. If that would have been it, that would have been enough. God, however, isn't going to stop there. After the three-year period ended in 2016, we saw an even greater alignment of celestial activity begin to take shape. That group of signs is stretched out over seven years. First, we experienced a three-year period of celestial signs, and now we have a seven-year period of celestial signs. The Bible establishes ten years as a length of time God often uses. I have been studying these signs since 2012. I knew they were coming, and I had my own interpretation about what they meant. That three-year period had everyone in an uproar. 
The short time frame consisted of a blood moon tetrad on the Lord's feast days, a prophetically aligned solar eclipse, and a historic Bethlehem star. This collection of signs has never happened in history. You can imagine why I and many other brothers and sisters in Christ who are anticipating the return of our Savior Jesus Christ would believe that the time period was ultimately marking the beginning of the tribulation and the catching away of the church. A blood moon tetrad, just like the most recent one we saw, took place over Israel in 1949 through 1950. This blood moon tetrad marked when the Jews regained their nation. Then, in 1967 through 1968, that same blood moon tetrad took place again over Israel. This tetrad marked the time when the Jews regained Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel. When we saw this most recent tetrad in 2014 through 2015 take place, it was safe to assume that the Jews were going to regain the Temple Mount. This particular event has not come to pass yet. Whenever the Jews regain their Temple Mount and build their third temple, a whole slew of prophetic events will be fulfilled, including the rapture and resurrection of the church. 2 Timothy 4.8 states, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. If you do not believe in God's blessings, you cannot take part in them. If you don't believe in the rapture, you certainly won't have a love for it which means you won't partake in it. Some people don't realize that salvation in Jesus only happens because we believe in it. Christians believe that Jesus saved us at the cross, and he sanctifies us now through his Holy Spirit. It's amazing they believe the first two blessings that saved our eternal soul and spirit, yet they refuse to believe in the rapture and resurrection that saves our soon-to-be eternal physical body. When we ask the Lord into our hearts, it is like a marriage. The Lord will draw us unto him for salvation, and we will feel pulled to him. A Jewish woman is only led toward a man who draws her in. He will introduce himself to her and go from there. It's the same with Jesus. When a woman agrees to marry a man, she receives a gift from him, often an engagement ring. When the woman accepts the gift, she is marked as completely off limits to other men. The men and women are spiritually connected in marriage, but not physically in the natural realm which does not happen until the wedding day. Their spiritual marriage is the modern-day equivalent of a wedding engagement. That is why Joseph was going to divorce Mary quietly when he found out she was pregnant with Jesus. Joseph had not had sex with Mary yet because they were still in the engagement period. The wedding culture of the Jewish people is a perfect parallel to the relationship we have with Jesus Christ. When we say yes to him, he gives us his gift, the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians. When we accept Jesus' gift, everyone knows we are marked for Him alone. We are off-limits to all false gods and their religions. Ephesians 2.8-9 states, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. At the end of the exchange, the Jewish man tells her that he's going to go away for a while to prepare a place for her in his father's house. In the father's house, he prepares a wedding chamber, which is an addition built on to the father's house. It would be their dwelling place for the seven-day wedding celebration. Jesus tells the church the same thing. John 14.3 states, And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. The bridegroom returns for his bride when she doesn't expect it. She, along with her bridesmaids, must be ready. He arrives with his groomsmen, blowing trumpets. He calls her outside. She and her bridesmaids go to meet him, and they all return to the house of the groom's father for the wedding feast. This parallels the rapture and resurrection of the church. Jesus is our bridegroom, and he will come with the angels blowing trumpets. He will come to our home, earth. He will meet us just outside the earth's atmosphere. He will call us out from earth. We will go and meet him, and we will return to his father's house, the third heaven. We will spend the next seven years there in a wedding celebration. This seven-year period takes place at the exact time as the seven-year tribulation. There are seven days in a week, and the seven-year tribulation is translated as a biblical week of years 
so instead of seven days, it's seven years. This is why it's called Daniel's 70th week. See the parallels? A traditional Jewish wedding feast lasts seven days. The tribulation is seven years. This proves that we will leave before the tribulation in the rapture and go to heaven for seven years for a wedding celebration. During that time, earth will be remodeled. Once that is done, we will return with Jesus. Let's talk about the seven years leading to 2024. I call the time period the last Trump celestial arrangement. There is a graph in the infographic section at the end of this book. You can see a combination of solar eclipses, blood moons, and other prophetic star alignments. You can also get a better view of this graph on my YouTube channel. The celestial arrangement from 2017 to 2024 is bookended with two solar eclipses. Both eclipses are only over America. The first eclipse took place on August 21, 2017, which was known as the American Eclipse. I have provided you a picture of the path of this eclipse in the infographic section at the end of this book. The eclipse started in the northwest region of the country and traveled diagonally to the southeast region. The eclipse split the country directly in half as you see in the picture here in the book. My home wasn't near the path of this eclipse. I live in northern Indiana, yet it still caused a lot of disruption in traffic because of all of the spectators. That gives you an idea about how popular the eclipse was compared to others in the past. God sent America a great sign, and he made sure the news got out. We will have another solar eclipse at the end of this seven-year period. It will take place on April 8, 2024. The 2024 eclipse will be almost identical, but it will take a slightly different path across the United States. The second eclipse will start in the southwest and exit in the northeast region of the United States. I have provided you a picture of the path of this eclipse as well, right here in this book. You may notice in the next picture that once you layer both paths on top of one another, an X comes into formation. I believe that's a message from God. There is something significant about the area and the intersection of the two paths, which I will explain in a little bit. The first eclipse path divided the country in two. Since then, America has been split in two parts, socially and politically. Around the time of the 2017 eclipse, the ultimate meaning to take away from the first eclipse is that God separates the wicked from the righteous. Perhaps the next eclipse will confirm the end of this separation process or represent an even greater divide in this country. The second American eclipse in 2024 may represent a further divide of those who will be free from those who end up in a concentration camp. There are 400 FEMA facilities in the United States to choose from. The Revelation 12 sign was definitely a rapture sign. Revelation 12, 1-2 states, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. The sign held all the hallmarks of the rapture. The Bible speaks of this sign and how a catching away will take place. There was a man-child who was caught up to the throne of God. That man-child was given authority to rule over earth with an iron rod. The man-child operates under the ultimate rulership of Jesus Christ. The Bible even calls Jesus the ruler over the kings of earth. Revelation 1.5 states, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus is called the King of Kings for that reason. Revelation 19.16 states, On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We are all kings in Jesus Christ because through him we are royalty. He glorified our bodies, souls, and spirits, and he made us one with him and his Father. John 17, 20-21 states, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. God has made us eternal, so we can live for eternity with Jesus and him. 
The man-child referenced here is also known as the Bride of Christ. The man-child corporately represents everyone who has accepted God's grace, covenant, through His Son, Jesus Christ. This includes everyone who has accepted Jesus since the day He resurrected till now. We all make up the body of Christ. Think of the word body as it's used in government terms. The governing body. There are small and large groups of people within each body. It's a collective group of people who are operating as a single entity. God takes it a step further, though. He refers to Israel as his wife. Jesus refers to the body of Christ as his wife. That is why there are so many wedding parallels for the rapture and resurrection. The church has many titles. The church, bride of Christ, man-child, hand of the restrainer, and more. We all have many titles. For instance, I am a father, husband, son, friend, co-worker, leader, brother, teacher, author, and more. Jesus is known under many titles as well. He is known as our Savior, King of Kings, Lamb of God, Root of David, Lord, Lion of Judah, and much more. He is also known as the Head of the Church, or our Headship. Colossians 1.18 states, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Here is a symbolic way to narrow down the possibility of when the rapture and resurrection of the body of Christ will take place. Jesus was born physically into the world over 2,000 years ago at the Feast of Trumpets. Jesus is our spiritual head, and we make up his spiritual body. Because the spiritual head was born into the world at the Feast of Trumpets, it's a possibility that his spiritual body will be born during these feast days as well. The head is now complete, and his body is soon to follow. The man-child then is caught up to heaven in the Revelation 12 sign. Simply put, it is a rapture sign in the midst of an incredibly prophetic celestial arrangement. Things like that don't just happen for no reason. In Genesis, God said that celestial bodies would be used as signs first. He's not going to display those signs simply because he enjoys looking at them. God always marks and confirms major events he carries out on earth. He has done it throughout history. The alignment of the activities on earth that have taken place at the time of the Revelation 12 sign is remarkable. The signs Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 24 about the end of the age and his return are now in full swing. The last Trump celestial arrangement is announcing his return, and the glorification process of his governing body is about to take place. The Revelation 12 sign is the greatest rapture sign ever. This sign took place during the greatest celestial arrangement in biblical history, the last Trump period. I believe this declares that Jesus will return soon. This celestial arrangement shows a blood moon that took place on January 20th, 2019. This blood moon is also known as a wolf moon. It's known as a wolf moon because it's the first blood moon of the year and takes place in winter. The wolves will cry out in the wilderness from hunger during this blood moon. Wolves kill and consume. They create a bloody mess around them. Wolves hunt in packs. It is fitting that the blood moon is also called a wolf moon. I believe these hungry wolves represent the hell-bound liberal left in this country who support abortion. They are hungry for blood and celebrated the announcement of this horrible law. The Reproductive Health Act is a New York statute enacted on January 22, 2019. That expanded abortion rights and eliminated several restrictions on abortion in the state. The law received national media attention. Signed into law January 22, 2019. Full name, Reproductive Health Act. Introduced January 9, 2019. Every left-leaning Democrat symbolizes a wolf. Wolves hunt in packs. Not every Democrat is a leftist. The Democratic Party in America is currently divided. Half of them are leftists, and the rest are undecided. Some claim to be conservative, while others are simply in between. The left-leaning Democratic wolves started out as a handful of people. Now they have grown in great numbers as they continue to recruit middle-standing Democrats over to their side. These leftist wolves have grown their pack to a great number so they will be safe as they begin their hunt. These wolves are out to shed blood. One of their greatest agendas is the continuation of the bloodshed of abortion by creating and supporting laws that support this murderous agenda. 
The church must use prayer to fight this. We need to propose other laws that will stop the wicked movement or slow it down. The problem now is that so many unrighteous laws are being introduced and we are being bombarded by them. We may stop one, but at the same time, three more appear. When the battle becomes too great for us to fight, God will fight the battle for us. The Bible says God would not put any more on you than what you can handle. 1 Corinthians 10.13 states, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with all temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may able to bear it. The Bible also says Jesus will tread the winepress alone. That means we will no longer fight. Isaiah 63.3 states, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. This happens when Jesus comes down for a period of time to wipe out a great deal of evildoers. After that, he returns to heaven and then will return to earth again with his armies. We see some remnants of their blood in the verse that mentions the garments of Jesus were dipped in blood. Revelation 19.3 states, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The last sign to take place in the celestial sign arrangement will be the solar eclipse set to take place on April 8th, 2024. It's the sign of the exit of the seven-year last trump. It may also mark the end of the division process God will have on those who are hot for him on his right and those who are cold for him on his left. Those who are in the middle will be harshly dealt with. The Bible says he will vomit those people out of his mouth. Revelation 3.16 states, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The separation of people will be just like when Jesus put the sheep to his right and the goats to his left, as referenced in Matthew. Now, imagine a parade of floats, and each has a sign that speaks the truth about good and evil. As the floats make their way down the road, people must get out of the way. The parade announced to them that the right side represents righteousness and the left side represents wickedness. They are forced to choose the right or the left side of the road. Naturally, the righteous people will choose the right side of the road, and the unrighteous will choose the left side of the road. Every float promotes righteousness. The righteous side will agree with the float's message, and the unrighteous side will disagree. Hopefully, a few people on the left side will allow their hearts to be convicted and will cross over to the right. I believe the right side will maintain every one, and none of them will ever go to the left side of the road. Now, imagine that road is the world. Those who have chosen the left side are cold for God, and those who have chosen the right side are hot for God. Everyone in the middle will get run over. God forces them to make a decision by blowing a trumpet straight down that street. The parade reveals the wickedness of governments and societies around the world. That is exactly what President Trump is doing. He was prophesied to be used by God to expose all the evil of the world while also strengthening the presence of righteousness in his elect. In the end, the middle of the street, lukewarm people will be grouped with the people who are cold for Christ on the left. The division process has to be complete before the tribulation can begin. God needs to separate the real Christians from the rest so he can rapture them from this world. He needs to know those who are lukewarm so he can leave them behind to die for him and become hot for him at the moment of death. Martyrs. Finally, he needs to know those who are cold for him. That way he can destroy them. There is something very alarming about the intersection of the pathways of the two eclipses I've mentioned. The intersection lands right over the New Madrid fault line. Next to the San Andreas fault line, the New Madrid line is the second largest in America. That leads me to my next interpretation. The first eclipse represented the split of America. And my guess is the second eclipse will mark a geographical divide of the country because the New Madrid fault line will quake and physically split the continent. 
That takes me back to my point earlier about the sixth seal. Can the greatest earthquake in history be generated during the sixth seal that Jesus opens? And can it be strong enough for the new Madrid fault line to split America in half? That earthquake could separate every single fault line around the world. Many believe a pole shift will happen on Earth at the opening of the sixth seal. There is a good chance that the sixth seal will take place in 2024 or 2025. The Bible says that at the sixth seal, the sun will turn dark as a sackcloth of hair. A Solar Eclipse Can the April 8, 2024 eclipse be the one to mark a potential ground zero area of the destruction that can only be achieved by a great earthquake? Like I said before, only time will tell what these two American eclipses will ultimately mean. What are the chances of all these timings, signs, pinpoints, and crossings coming together in such a perfect picture? I believe Jesus Christ is coming very soon. It is time for us to get ready for his return. Last Trump Rapture and Resurrection If we take all the celestial signs we have seen between 2014 and 2024 into account, not factoring in all the earthly activities, you will realize there is more celestial activity to this magnitude after the last Trump ends in 2024. There are some lunar and solar eclipses in the future, but nothing to this magnitude. You won't see them all bunched up in a group like this again for another 500 years. This forces us to take notice of what's going on. I believe this is pointing towards something really big that is about to happen. The biggest thing that could possibly happen isn't a pole shift or something like that. It is something much bigger. I believe it is the resurrection rapture event that marks the end of the age of grace and the beginning of a new dispensation of wrath, the seven year tribulation. It's a complete contrast between an age of total forgiveness and an age of unforgiveness and judgment. People don't understand the magnitude of this resurrection and the rapture. Do you know about the study of the Shroud of Turin? The Turin is the garment Jesus was wrapped in while he was in the tomb. The Shroud shows an imprint of Jesus' body, which is visible to the naked eye. According to scientists, the amount of energy and power it took to imprint Jesus' body on the thick shroud is equivalent to the energy of a bomb leveling a small city. That means when Jesus was resurrected, a supernatural burst of energy took place, and it flashed a negative print of his body onto the shroud. The Shroud of Turin is a gigantic negative of Jesus Christ's body. We must ask ourselves, what else could cause the imprint on the shroud? The only possible answer is that there was a flash of energy when Jesus changed from mortal to immortal, when he was resurrected. That is the part scientists can't figure out, because they can't understand the resurrection of the mortal to immortal. That is why Paul called the rapture and resurrection a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15, 51-53. Now, did you know that this same resurrection power is within the bodily DNA of born-again believers? The DNA becomes an explosive when it is activated, as was the case with the Shroud of Turin. The same thing will happen to us during the resurrection and the rapture. If we become the same as Jesus, then it is safe to assume the same supernatural explosive process will take place for us. The Bible says when we see him, we shall be like him. Imagine that all the dead in Christ worldwide will experience that transformation. Then all the living in Christ will experience the transformation as well. That a great EMP, electromagnetic pulse, knocks out the power worldwide at the end of the Age of Grace. This EMP puts the world into complete darkness. A physical darkness, as well as a spiritual darkness, will take place. Jesus is the light of the world. His light is represented in the church. The world went into spiritual darkness because the church was removed at the rapture. Another question is, do all the tombs need to be open for the people to leave them? No. The Bible talks about how Jesus was able to disappear and reappear in rooms with locked doors and walk through walls. So there is no need for all the tombs to be open, but many will open to prove their inhabitants were resurrected. There are tombs of Old Testament saints, such as King David, that are still sealed, yet we know he was resurrected and is now in heaven. Let's get back to the resurrection rapture EMP. 
there will be an incalculable amount of energy surging around the earth when billions of the dead are reunited with Christ during the resurrection. That energy will create an unknown amount of damage around the world. Imagine the ground rumbling because of the explosions happening when billions of graves open. I believe the graves will explode. We saw this happen at Jesus' resurrection when the stone was rolled away from the tomb's entrance during a great earthquake. Now we are aware of the explosive power involved in Jesus' resurrection. Imagine that explosion of energy multiplied into billions during the resurrection. There will be billions of explosions all over the face of the earth. Spirits have great power over electrical energy. Outside of the commonality of blinking lights and haunted houses, spirits can control other forms of electricity. On ghost hunting shows, I have watched people encounter a spirit and the batteries in their camera equipment drain within seconds. The electricity in our bodies is a physical manifestation of our spiritual bodies. Electricity plays a large role in the rapture and resurrection. One lightning strike can knock out power up to a quarter of a mile. There are 100 lightning strikes per second worldwide according to a study found on weatherstem.com. Now imagine if billions of lightning strikes hit the earth at one time. Do you think that would cause a worldwide power outage? Do you think that they may set off fires and chaos around the world? I believe that is what the rapture and resurrection will be like. It seems fitting to end the dispensation of grace and launch the seven-year tribulation that way. The Bible even says there are horsemen that remove peace from earth. Revelation 6.4 states, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. It is time to repent for your sins and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There will be two rounds of energy explosions. The first will be the resurrection of the dead. It's amazing to think that we will be like Jesus at the resurrection. The Bible also says we will be like the angels. Matthew 22.30 states, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Between those verses alone, it is clear that we will be beings of light. I remember a dream one of my subscribers sent me. His dream was his experience when he received his immortal body. A woman was inside a very dark house, and she was in need of help. He walked through the darkness searching for her. His body illuminated every room he entered. A body of light is a commonality I see in dreams and visions. The Bible says Jesus will return in a cloud of power and great glory. We see clouds every day, but they're not that powerful or glorious. So what is this cloud the Bible mentions? This cloud will be made up of billions of saints riding on white horses, accompanied by warrior angels. Each one of them will be shining brighter than the sun. All these beings accumulated together will look like a powerful and glorious cloud of light. The word cloud in ancient Greek means a large group of people, like a cloud of soldiers. Back in those days, a group of 6,000 soldiers was referred to as a cloud of soldiers. When they were seen crossing a desert area from a distance, the army looked like a great white cloud. It was not just from the size of the group of men moving together, but also because of all the dust they kicked up. The dust would rise over their heads and surround the group. The Bible says the living will be caught up to meet the resurrected dead in the air. Will the living see a huge cloud of light in the sky when all the resurrected people gather together? Wouldn't that group in the sky look like a huge cloud? That happened with Jesus when he ascended into heaven. The Bible says Jesus went up to the sky in a cloud. Was it instead a cloud of the resurrected Old Testament saints and the apostles assumed it was just an ordinary cloud? I believe it was a cloud of resurrected saints. Jesus was caught up into the sky and met them in the air. Then they all left together to go to heaven. Those who met Jesus in the cloud were resurrected saints who came out of their graves at Jesus' resurrection. Those of us who will be raptured will go up and meet the resurrected saints in the air. Then we will travel to heaven as a group. I don't know why it is that way. Perhaps there is so much darkness around the earth 
that a group must come and open a doorway for someone to travel through. It could also be a customary protocol of cosmic travel in the spiritual realm. The Bible talks about a demonic principality barrier that is around Earth. Daniel prayed for 21 days before Gabriel showed up with an answer to his prayer. Gabriel said they received his prayer the first day, but could not make it through the barrier because he was held up by principalities for 21 days. Gabriel had to bring Michael, the archangel, to bust a hole through the barrier so they could get through. Jesus says no one knows the day or hour of his return except his Father in heaven. Matthew 24, 36 states, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Many believe Jesus currently knows the day and hour of his return because he now sits at the right-hand side of his Father in heaven. When he said these words quoted in Matthew 24, 36, he was not yet glorified in his body, because the glorification of his body has everything to do with the rapture and resurrection. I believe this information was not made known unto him at this point in time. Jesus wanted to give all edification to God. That is what Jesus did throughout his ministry. He referred to the one who sent him, God the Father. Jesus wanted to ensure God the Father was recognized alongside his existence even more than himself, because he was not yet glorified. Though Jesus is God in the flesh, he was not yet glorified. He didn't even refer to himself as good when he was addressed as a good teacher. That was because he was not yet glorified in his body. Now, Jesus definitely deserves the title, Good Teacher. Before his glorification, Jesus continued to edify God's position. When Jesus finally sat down at the right hand of the Father, he received the classified information God had kept from him while he was on earth. Because God withheld information from Jesus while he was on earth, the information about the day of our rapture and resurrection was greatly protected by God. That is why Christians argue about the second coming of Jesus. There is no definitive date in the Bible except shadows, parallels, and doctrines. God also wants to keep the information from our enemies. If demons and fallen angels knew the day of our rapture, don't you think they would concentrate all their attention on the earth's barrier to prevent a large mass from coming or going? Perhaps this is why the resurrection and the rapture happens in the twinkling of an eye. This event will happen so fast that the powers of darkness will instantly get blindsided by it. We will all be gone before they have any time to react. I believe it may also happen like this. When the Lord shows up in the earth's atmosphere, all powers of darkness will run away and hide in absolute fear from the Lord. I have seen this many times in near-death experiences of people who have gone to hell. When Jesus shows up in hell to pull them out, he is a great light, and all the demons become tiny. They hide themselves, trembling in fear. Darkness always flees from the light. This is why darkness in a room is instantly expelled by turning on a light. It is a law set forth by God in the natural that is the same in the spiritual. With that in mind, why would the demons in the earth's atmosphere react any differently? That is how it is for Jesus. But what about angels assigned to do work on the earth? We read in the Bible about Gabriel, who is a messenger angel working on the earth in the book of Daniel and in the four Gospels, when he appeared to Mary, the biological mother of Jesus. Gabriel is a messenger and warrior angel as well, because he must be able to defend himself behind enemy lines here on earth. He told Daniel he would join Michael in the war after leaving him. Clearly, the earth's barrier can be breached. If Michael can puncture it, imagine what Jesus can do. The Bible says the breach will happen at the resurrection and rapture. The breach is a door John saw in heaven in Revelation 4.1. The door will remain open long enough to resurrect the dead and have them ascend to a meeting place in the atmosphere of the earth. Then the rapture will take place. They too will be caught up to the meeting place. From there, they all go into the third heavens and the door closes. We even see the door open for a short period of time in the parable of the ten bridesmaids. The door of the wedding was open, and the five bridesmaids who were wise, along with the bride, entered into the wedding. The five bridesmaids who were foolishly not ready found a closed door. This can be found in Matthew 25, 
verse 1 through 13. How long will the rapture and resurrection take place from start to finish? In this scenario, the enemy will hide for an extended period of time. It is also possible that the resurrection and rapture could happen in the twinkling of an eye. Our change from mortal to immortality happens in a twinkling of an eye according to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. What if we stepped out of time into the spiritual realm where time no longer has any bearing on the event? The Bible says that one day with the Lord is like 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is like a day. 2 Peter 3, 8 states, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. How are we to understand the twinkling of an eye scripture then? I believe those who are left behind for the tribulation will see the rapture and resurrection take place in the twinkling of an eye because they are limited to time like the devil. This event will look like it took place within a tenth of a second. There are so many different ways to view this event. If the entire event takes place in the twinkling of an eye, the enemy will wonder what happened. The devil and his kingdom are bound by time, which means we would all be extracted from earth and on our way to heaven before Satan could blink. Revelation 22.12 states, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. The glorified church is his reward. Many people think his reward is rewards for people on earth. The Bible refers to Jesus' rewards, not people's rewards. The only reward we receive is not being thrown into the hellfire. Instead, we receive passage into heaven. If Jesus labels us as sheep, that is our reward. The sheep are mortal beings during the thousand-year reign of Christ. You and I will be immortal beings. Only immortal beings rule the earth with Christ. One of Satan's greatest fears is a whole body of people standing against him. The Bible says that when two or more gather in Jesus' name, he is in the midst of them. Matthew 18.20 states, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Can you see the parallel of why it starts with two and then says, or more are gathered together in my name? That is more voices against Satan. This number can be any number because not every family has the same amount of people. That is why a family united in Christ is so important. Satan wants to separate and destroy families. Satan is after anything that threatens the family unit. Without the family unit intact, it is impossible to pass on family values. Without the family unit intact, social stability is impossible. Without social stability, it is impossible to pass on social values from one generation to the next. The order of progression in authority is the most important aspect of the family. It's the order of God's headship protection. Paul said that God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman. Ephesians 5.23 states, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. That is the spiritual authority and protection order. Satan simply has to mess up that line of progression and the family will fall apart. He will encourage men and women to switch positions or gender roles. Everything will go into chaos, ending marriage and creating an environment of unorganized leadership that produces unruly children. That is why there is so much gender confusion in our world today. Satan tries to corrupt men and women who want to get married. He will pursue the corruption before and after they are married. He encourages the movie industry, politicians, and other forms of leadership to push women to act like men and men to act like women. My wife has a college degree, and she has a great job. I had a good job and was laid off in 2009. Instead of our kids going to daycare, I stayed home with them for a year. My oldest son was two years old at the time, and my second son was a newborn. I'll tell you what, I couldn't wait to go back to work. Call me old-fashioned, but I love being the provider and protector of my family. That is how God hardwired me. That is something I dreamed about since I was 12 years old. I watched my dad and my grandfathers do it. I always had a great capacity for love, so I would often dream about having a wife and children. 
I wanted to be the hero for them and take care of them, just like my dad did for my mother, my siblings, and myself. I have five siblings, so even if my mom had wanted to work, she couldn't have. Genesis 3.19 states, You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. That translates to, we must work for his blessing. Adam had to work for the provisions he used to receive without effort in the Garden of Eden. Eve's punishment was painful childbirth. God didn't call her to work a field with Adam between her painful births like many women today. Satan has created all sorts of displacement combinations. Men act like women, and women try not to act like men. Mothers are forced to be both parents. There is no direct protection over the family because Satan switches up the order of the headship protection that God gave mankind. Satan knows that is the key. He has seen great success with it. He uses some public school systems to create confusion in children about their gender when they're young, even as early as kindergarten. If he can start at a young age, there is no telling what the result will be. Ultimately, Satan wants to see normal, functioning families come to an end. During the last Trump period, we see multiple signs and wonders that bring this time frame to life, with an incredible combination of signs in the heavens, on earth, and the earth below. These are the obvious signs on earth. Immense uptick of wars and rumors of wars. Record amount of earthquakes. Record amount of volcanic activity. Record amount of famine. Record amount of pestilence. Record amount of deception. Record amount of wickedness. Record amount of lawlessness. Record amount of UFO activity. Record division among people. Record speed of information and growth. Record demonic spirit apparition activity. Record hatred of all righteousness. Record persecution of the church. Record hatred for Jesus. Even though all these things are horrible, some good things are happening in God's kingdom. A good portion of the church is awake now and doing its best to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. I am doing my best with my YouTube channels, websites, and Feed My Sheep Today, which is our Christian mission support charity. There are a lot of good things happening in the world that represents the light of Jesus Christ. We can do everything we can, but until God gives us a hand with governments and leadership around the world, we're not going to see the changes we are looking for. This all changed at the beginning of the last Trump period. I was excited when President Trump won the U.S. election, and so was the majority of the Christian and Jewish world. We needed President Trump to make it to the Oval Office. Never have we seen a president be elected and face the fear of not making it to his inauguration day. Every time a presidential exchange took place, each president transitioned smoothly to the next. The reason why is because they were all appointed Manchurian candidates placed into presidency by the deep state for the benefit of their eventual One World Order agenda. That was not the case for Donald Trump. Obama and his administration tried to hide their evil doings, but thankfully, the Trump administration caught on. Trump was not supposed to win the presidential election. The deep state Luciferian cult has said this over and over again. I guess they didn't read in Daniel where it says that God puts kings into power and removes kings from power. Daniel 2.21 states, And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. According to that verse, God appointed every person to leadership throughout history which means God would have something to do with the appointment of each U.S. president. As much of an unrighteous person as Obama is, God appointed him for a purpose. Why would God give us such a horrible, satanic leader? This country for a time had turned away from God by removing prayer from schools, taking down crosses, and much more. What happened to Israel every time they turned away from God and went after false gods and idols? God gave them a bad leader. The United States is a Christian nation. It's a mixture of different types of Christians, but Jesus lovers overall. We make up around 65% of the population in this country according to a poll on Wikipedia. That is one of the reasons why this country is the greatest nation next to Israel. 
I hold Israel in higher esteem because Israel is God's physical promised land on the earth, and it's a capital of the world according to the Bible during the millennial reign. Throughout the Old Testament, when the Israelites turned from God, he would give them bad leadership to chastise them and bring correction on them. The United States began to turn away from God, so he gave us bad leadership to chastise us as well. This was why God appointed Obama and his administration as our leadership for two terms. This administration doubled our national debt within only eight years. They caused incredible damage to the United States in every sector of our operations. The amount of damage they did is too great to list in this book. Just research these things for yourself. Obama and his administration completely disregarded our Constitution. I am so happy and pleased to be living under our great Constitution. Yet Obama had the arrogance to go on TV and say America was no longer a Christian nation. He said that because he managed to increase the Muslim population in 0.6 in 2010 to 1.1% by 2017, according to Pew Research. That was accomplished only through mass open-door immigration policies. Obama was so sure that migration would overpopulate the United States with Muslims and turn it into a Muslim nation. It happened to Europe, and look how that country went down the drain. Europe paid the ultimate price to show the rest of the world that the mass migration of Muslims is destructive to a non-Muslim nation. God separated us into nations by separating our language at the Tower of Babel for a reason. Genesis 11:2 through 9 states, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. He knew we would not coexist here on earth. He wanted every nation to worship him in his or her own language. God understood the Tower of Babel brought everyone into one accord and voice. Satan was so excited at the Tower of Babel because he sat on top of the world, getting ready to take over. It was critical for God to intervene. God knew that if everyone came under one voice, they would be lost to Satan. God wants us divided into nations. We are one kingdom under God in heaven. But it is different on the earth. There is only one body on earth that God wants unified and that's the body of Christ. Unfortunately, Satan spends more time splitting up the church than any other group. Satan desperately tries to unite all cultures and people into one. Then, on the other side of the spectrum, he tries to divide the body of Christ. He knows if we come together under Christ, we will cause immense damage to his plan. I would love to see this happen. Only God can put a permanent end to Satan's kingdom but the body of Christ can cause great significant damage. We fight the devil in our personal, spiritual battles, but imagine the strength of the bride of Christ if used against Satan. The strength of the church came together in prayer three days before the 2016 United States election. I did my part by praying as well. A great number of Jews and Christians across the nation joined in prayer to God that Donald Trump would win the election. God answered our prayers and gave us the greatest president in the history of this nation.
At the same time, God handed the globalists their greatest defeat. They were so close to world domination. They used the power of the United States military-industrial complex to strong-arm most of the nations around the world into globalism. Once that was done, they only had to take down the home base, the United States. Globalists saved their greatest fight for last, which wasn't very smart. They used the last six presidents to take over nations around the world and sucked America of all its resources. They re-educated America through Hollywood and public schools. One thing is for sure, I love the coming of the Lord, and I'm very excited about it. In Genesis, Enoch had faith, and the Lord took him because of it. Hebrews 11.5 states, By faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. I welcome everyone's research about the possible times of Jesus' return. None of us has it figured out. Jesus is watching us search for him. He is flattered and full of joy because it is one of the ways we show our love for him. The Bible says that God is a jealous God, so it is fair to say that he has feelings about the way we live for him. I love the research I do, especially the last Trump research. No one knows the day or hour of his return. I get it. Yet this season of the last Trump looks favorable for the resurrection and rapture to take place. I don't know if it will happen. If it doesn't, then we move on to the next set of circumstances that may point to his return. I'm okay with living my life this way. I have planned out my physical life like I'll be here 40 years from now, but I live my spiritual life like I can leave today. With that said, I'd like to present some very simple math from my research. Some of you have figured this out already, but some of you haven't. Israel celebrated its 70th anniversary as a nation on May 14, 2018, as it was established as a nation back on May 14, 1948. We all know that there are seven years to the tribulation period, three and a half years for the wrath of the Lamb, then three and a half years for the wrath of God. According to the Bible, one generation is generally given 70 years to live or, by reason of strength, 80. This means the average human lifespan is 70 to 80 years. Psalm 90 verse 10 states, The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Revelation states that seven trumpets will sound during the tribulation. In the Bible, seven means finished, complete, and perfect. Israel just celebrated its 70th anniversary in 2018. On May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion the head of the Jewish agency proclaimed the establishment to the State of Israel. In May 1946, Truman announced his approval of a recommendation to admit 100,000 displaced persons into Palestine and in October publicly declared his support for the creation of a Jewish state. The Bible prophesied that Israel would be born again into the world after its destruction in 70 AD. Isaiah 66, 8 states, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. If God launched the seven-year tribulation at the end of the 70th anniversary of Israel, which would have been May 14, 2019, then from that day to May 14, 2020, would mark the 71st year. The first year of the tribulation would commence during the 71st year of Israel being a nation. There's an overlap taking place there. The second year of the tribulation would be during the 72nd year of Israel being a nation. The pattern would continue until we reach the final year of the seven-year tribulation, which would land on the 77th year of Israel being a nation. If that is the case, then that would be the year when the seventh angel blows the seventh trumpet. Revelation identifies the seven angels with the seven trumpets who are unleashed from the opening of the seventh seal. That creates an alignment of 777. 
The first six angels who blow their trumpets initiate six series of judgments on destruction of earth. The seventh trumpet initiates something completely different. The seventh trumpet does not announce another plague. Revelation 11.15 states, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. The seventh trumpet is the dispensation transition declaration trumpet. The trumpet announces the end of one age, which is the seven-year tribulation, and the beginning of a new age, the thousand-year millennial reign. If that is the case, then the 78th anniversary of Israel will be the first official year of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. That is fitting because in the Bible, the number eight means new beginnings. What if God kicked off the seven-year tribulation in the year of the 74th anniversary or the 79th anniversary? The numbers wouldn't align. There may be an even greater time alignment than this, but for right now, this one deserves our attention. We shall wait and see what happens. Covenant with Many in the Last Trump There is a prophecy of a historical agreement in Daniel 9.27 that ushers in the seven-year tribulation. Daniel 9.27 states, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. This agreement is known as a two-state solution peace plan. I have interesting information that pertains to the peace plan, which was developed by the Trump administration. These events may be lining up with the coming rapture of the church and a seven-year tribulation. The Trump administration presented its peace plan, also known as the Deal of the Century, to Israel and the world officially on January 28, 2020. Regardless of what is contained in it, it is still a bad move because we are still dividing up God's land that he gave only to the Hebrews. There is a big problem in this two-state solution. First is the obvious. Don't divide God's land, which he gave to Israel. That's an obvious bad move and would bring judgment on America. Would God pass great judgment on America? Of course he would, but God won't do it until America gives him the right to do it. As of writing this book, I heard there is no state provided for the Palestinians in the New Deal. Let's be frank. The Palestinians have already taken 85% of Israel. President Trump knows better than to give them more land. I'm sure he also understands that if he divides the little Israel has left, it will bring judgment from God. I'm sure someone gave him the memo on that. With the current deal, Palestinians face a brick wall with nowhere to go. They can enjoy the land they have already taken, which is 70 times larger than Israel currently has right now. That is more room than they will ever need. Palestinians never bring anything to the table during negotiations. All they do is offer peace for the next move, and they've done that multiple times before. History has shown us that Palestinians never honor their end of the deal. The more land they take, the more military bases they build so they can attack Israel. Ultimately, they will want a total annihilation of Israel. Even if Muslims received all of Israel except for a tiny building that housed all the Jews at the edge of the border of Israel, it still wouldn't be enough. They would find a reason to need that building and the small plot of land it was on. Obviously, President Trump's deal of the century won't fix anything. I'll tell you what it will do, however. It will spark a war. The tension between the Jews and Arabs needs to be released. That will be the war mentioned in Ezekiel 38, and it has not taken place yet. During that war, all Muslims surrounding Israel will be destroyed for the most part. After that, they will back off from Israel. They won't have any other option at that point but to accept the peace deal. What if Israel doesn't want to give the Palestinians anything after dominating them during the war? That would be like paying reparations to an army you just defeated. So how will the deal of Daniel 9.27 be confirmed? 
it will take someone who is able to greatly flatter the leadership of Israel to get them to come to the negotiating table. That someone will be the Antichrist. Daniel 11.27 states, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably, and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. The Antichrist will probably praise Israel for how great and powerful they are. Flatteries. And he will tell them they should have nothing to fear regarding confirming the deal with remaining Muslims. This will all be lies that the Antichrist will tell Israel. He will say to Israel that the whole world just watched you destroy the Muslims who came against you, though it was God who did all the work. He will tell the Jews that they had the right to defend themselves. The Antichrist will then tell Israel that the whole world is angry with them now and will attack them. Can Israel truly defend themselves if the whole world is going to come up against them at some point like the Bible says? Zechariah 12.3 states, And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut into pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. He will continue, you need to do something that will look great in the eyes of the world. Sign the peace agreement with the Muslims and let them continue living in your land. Show the world that you still love the Palestinian and Muslim people, and the world will love you. Show the world you were defending yourself from your attackers. Wouldn't that sound good to the people of Israel? You bet. Israel would have experienced an incredible victory and then want to sustain their dominance. The peace deal would keep the rest of the world from busting down the doors of Israel. The Antichrist will continue to tell Israel they must show the world they have compassion for the Muslims by accepting the peace deal. They will be told that the Muslims who desire their destruction are all dead. But the poor, remaining Muslims are not the same as the radical Muslims who desired their death. That is another lie because Muslims do eventually become radicalized they're just not mature enough in their faith yet. Israel eventually agrees to the lies, and the Antichrist will move forward and confirm the agreement. He will strengthen the deal by making amendments to it. By either adding or taking away certain aspects, the Antichrist will use President Trump's peace plan as the foundation for the final agreement. By doing this, the Antichrist will strengthen it in a way that both sides agree to it. When he confirms the covenant, he will do it by flatteries and a whole lot of lying. The Bible says the devil is the father of lies. John 8.44 states, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. He will say something like, These leftover Muslims will never do you any harm. They won't rebuild their armies against you if you let them peacefully into Israel. Those are lies. Keep in mind, for the first three and a half years of the tribulation, there will be a false peace between Muslims and Jews in Israel. Not peace throughout the world. That will only happen when God destroys the nations currently surrounding Israel that seek her destruction. Let's face it. I don't think the Antichrist can come in right now and lie and flatter these Muslim nations into loving Israel. He has a better chance of wrestling the wind. The Antichrist's lies and flatteries won't be any good for either side until the tensions of war are released. I know they are trying to arrange for peace, but that's not going to happen until a war happens. The devil wants the war mentioned in Ezekiel 38 to happen because he gets to harvest the Muslim souls when they die. He also wants a third temple built so he can sit in the temple of God and be worshipped as God. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 states, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God? I guess the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the middle of Jerusalem doesn't mean anything to the Antichrist. He doesn't care to sit in the middle of the mosque. If he wanted to, he would be sitting there in the Antichrist body right now. The devil has his hopes set on the true temple of God that the chosen people of God will build. 
So Satan is pushing the Muslims to attack because he knows God is going to defend Israel and destroy the other nations. By killing those Muslim nations, God will be doing Satan a favor. Satan wants everyone on earth dead. No flesh will make it to the end of the tribulation unless God intervenes. Matthew 24, 22 states, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. With those nations dead and tensions removed, the Antichrist can enter with flatteries to confirm President Trump's peace deal that was presented to them before the war. All flatteries will be directed mainly toward Israel. The Antichrist will probably tell Israel that they have the dominant position in the deal. They own the whole thing, but they should allow some of the Muslim refugees to live in Israel. He will continue to flatter the leadership of Israel by telling them how mighty they are and that they should have a heart for the remaining Muslims after the war. He will tell them that they should allow them to stay in Israel to prove to the world that the greatest and most powerful nation on earth has a heart and allows their defeated Muslims to continue to live in their country. Sounds like flattery to me. Satan doesn't have to flatter Muslim nations because they will be considered less than that, which they are to the rest of the world. Satan has control over them anyway. He will continue to lie to them while also lying to Israel. Either before, during, or sometime after the war mentioned in Ezekiel 38, the Daniel 9.27 covenant with many peace agreements may then be implemented. This peace agreement is the number one sign that narrows down the upcoming rapture and resurrection of the church. The signs we see in the last Trump period will help us to narrow down the possible time this extremely prophetic event will take place. I believe this agreement will be reached any time between now and 2024, which is the end of the last Trump period. This info is displayed on the timeline chart in the infographic section of this book. President Trump and his administration put together a plan and it's ready to be presented to Israel and the Palestinians. Can that peace deal be the same one as mentioned in Daniel 9.27? Daniel 9.27 states, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. At the beginning of 2020, Israel is still in a stalemate with their failed elections. My knowledge is currently limited as to what will happen with the revealing of this peace plan. I've heard the media say both sides have supporters, and some don't support the two-state solution at all. Most Muslims are against the building of the Jewish temple. There is no benefit for them because they just want Israel and the Jewish people to be wiped out of existence. The only reason why some Muslims will allow the building of the third Jewish temple is because they believe their Muslim Messiah, who is the biblical Antichrist, is the one who will take over the Jewish temple and exterminate the Jews. Maybe that is why they want the temple built. If Muslims believe this, they are absolutely correct. The Muslim Messiah will take over the Jewish temple and attempt to kill the Jews of Israel. The Bible warns the Jewish people of this. Matthew 24, 15 through 16 states, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. The peace agreement will be a trigger for the war of Ezekiel 38. That chapter talks about the demonic enemies of Israel that will develop and eventually surround her. Right now, Israel is completely surrounded by Islamic nations. All of them are seeking her destruction and the destruction of America. President Trump's peace agreement may be the lit fuse to set the whole thing off. I say this because the Islamic nations say they want half of current Israel today to become New Palestine. Unfortunately, it won't stop there. They ultimately want Israel erased from existence. Dividing up Israel again will put Muslims one step closer to Israel's complete annihilation. Their problem is the new peace deal won't give them a single square foot of land from Israel, which means no new Palestine. 
At this point, the Muslims will realize they have no other choice but to go to war with Israel. That will be the War of Ezekiel 38. Muslim armies will converge on Israel, and God will destroy them all. We will watch intently for that war. When it does happen, it can trigger the resurrection and rapture. If that is the case, a historic war will take place in heaven at the same time. The concept is that what happens in the supernatural can manifest in the natural. A great war in heaven will take place around the same time as the rapture and resurrection. That war will be between Michael and the archangel's army and Satan and his army. Revelation 12 discusses that war. The Bible says Satan and the rest of the fallen angels were kicked out of heaven and down to earth. Satan and his army will lose the war just like the Muslims will lose around the same time. I believe the rapture and resurrection happens at the same time because we are in heaven, celebrating the removal of these fallen angels and their recent defeat. I believe we are their replacements. When we are caught up in the rapture resurrection, they are cast down to earth. Revelation 12.12 12 states, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. The Bible says the dragon swept a third of the stars to earth. This confirms Satan led a third of the angels of heaven to turn away from God, and their punishment was banishment to the earth. They were imprisoned here and can no longer leave the planet. We, however, receive the exact opposite reward. We will be removed from our imprisonment on earth and taken to our place in heaven. The Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, who accuse us day and night before God. Before the entire body of Christ will be fully redeemed and taken up into heaven at the rapture and resurrection, Satan will have no one left on earth to accuse. The body of Christ is the brethren he accuses non-stop. God stripped Satan of his heavenly authority and evicted him by force from heaven along with his followers. He lost all authority in the vastness of the second heaven and was cast down to earth. That would be pretty traumatic for anyone. We can see why Satan would be upset. The Bible says the dragon will be enraged and will pursue the woman and her offspring. The woman represents the Jews. The offspring represents all the left-behind Gentile, lukewarm saints of the church. Any human being would resent his defeat and his eternal demise. It's easy to say why he wants them all to suffer and die. He also wants all of them to worship him on the way to their death. It sounds like a miserable situation on earth during that time. That persecution is represented in Revelation 13 where Satan forces his mark of the beast onto everyone on earth. By doing so, he will cause all humans to worship him and eventually die or be executed for refusing the mark. If you take the mark of the beast, your DNA will change and become like Nephilim flesh, hence ending human flesh. The execution operation also ends human flesh. Satan can still achieve a form of victory by ending all human flesh on earth. To make sure that this doesn't happen, God will shorten those days to save a remainder of the flesh which is called the elect. Matthew 24:22 states, And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Throughout the last Trump period, we have seen an immense acceleration in all signs of the end times. They all accelerated at the same time and are overlapping each other. This is an incredible indicator that the rapture and resurrection will soon happen and the tribulation will begin. The end times started about 2,000 years ago, when Jesus ascended into heaven. Imagine a toilet paper roll on a giant stand that has the diameter of one mile instead of five to six inches we are used to. You pull on the toilet paper roll, and it spins slowly because of its massive size. In the beginning, it may take you months or years to get to the center of the toilet paper roll to spin all the way around just once. At that rate, it may take you 2,000 years to get all the way down to the one-inch wide cardboard cylinder in the middle. 
In the beginning, it will spin slowly, but the closer you get to the center, the faster that center cardboard cylinder will spin. Eventually, you will reach the end of the giant toilet paper roll, and the last piece will detach from the cardboard cylinder. The end times is represented by this giant toilet paper roll. In fact, the toilet paper roll represents the age of the church. The faster the center of the roll spins, the more signs of the absolute end times begin to manifest on Earth. The frequency of signs related to the end times have slowly accelerated every year over a period of almost 2,000 years. For example, the first year the Jews saw one sign of the end times that Jesus warned them about. The second year, instead of one sign, they saw two signs. The third year, instead of two signs, they saw three signs. More signs are added each year. Now, almost 2,000 years later, we are witnessing countless signs on a daily basis. So, the toilet paper makes revolutions at lightning speed. Though it took 30 years for it to spin one time around, now it only takes one-tenth of a second. You can watch the news and see stories all day long that point toward biblical prophecy. There are so many stories that it would take a team of supercomputers to keep track of them all. That sounds like an acceleration to me. 2,000 years ago, end time signs started out as single raindrops here or there that could be counted. But now this frequency is so quick that there is no way to keep track of it. The rapture resurrection will take place very soon. Will it take place sometime in the middle of the last Trump period where we see all these signs simultaneously taking place? Can it take place after 2024? Can the rapture take place one, two, five, or even seven years afterward? No one except God knows for sure. The first century church looked for Jesus' second coming almost 2,000 years ago. John the Beloved, who was the last apostle to die, believed the rapture would take place right before his death. Maybe the first century church all surrounded John when he died, anxiously waiting for the rapture. It didn't come. Jesus told the apostles that one of them would not taste death until he saw Jesus coming in his glory. John wrote about the book of Revelation from visions he received on the island of Patmos around 90 AD. In his visions before he died, John saw Jesus coming in his glory. Revelation 1-7 states, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so. Amen. The catching away of the church, which is known as the rapture, has a high probability of taking place in the next five years. Notice that the whole last Trump timeline is one big rapture sign. This rapture sign has never happened and will never happen again. The Revelation 12 sign is at the heart of the sign that took place on September 23, 2017. That was the greatest rapture sign we have seen. That is why it makes up the heart of the last Trump time period. It is the only sign we have ever seen that lines up with the Revelation 12 sign. Revelation 19.11 states, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Let that sink in for a minute. Read the bulleted points I have laid out below. They will show you why the seven-year last Trump period is one big rapture sign. This seven-year period is marked by two historic eclipses over America. Donald Trump will be the president for the duration of the period. President Trump is being used by God as a trumpet which also includes his name. President Trump's name is used in the rapture, the last Trump. You will find this in 1 Corinthians 15, 61 through 63. The Revelation 12 sign happened in this timeline only. This sign will never happen again. All human activities on earth are fulfilling countless Bible prophecies about the end times at an accelerated rate since the last Trump period started in 2017. There has been a huge increase in volcanic activity and earthquakes as well. The fact that this once-in-history rapture sign showed up in the middle of the seven-year last Trump period has to be pointing towards something. That sign gives the entire seven-year last Trump timeline a life all its own. 
Seven Years of Feast, Seven Years of Famine Now we will cover the seven years of feast and seven years of famine and how this concept applies to the last Trump period. There is a story about Joseph in the Bible. He was one of the twelve sons of Jacob. Joseph said that in a dream he saw his father and brothers bow down to him. That information didn't set well with his brothers because Joseph was already their father's favorite, so much the favorite that Jacob even made a coat of many colors for Joseph. After learning of the dream and seeing the coat that Joseph received, his brothers became jealous and decided they'd had enough. They wanted Joseph out of their lives. They threw Joseph into a deep pit and covered his coat with animal blood. Later that day, they sold Joseph as a slave to Egyptian traders. They presented his coat to Jacob and told him Joseph was killed by a wild animal. In reality, Joseph went to Egypt as a slave for the foreseeable future. During that time, God elevated Joseph in prison and gave him favor with the guards and those who ran the prison. The greatest anointing given to Joseph was the interpretation of dreams and visions. Joseph became known for it. Then, one day, Pharaoh learned of Joseph and requested his help. Joseph interpreted a dream for Pharaoh. He explained to Pharaoh that Egypt had seven years of feast and seven years of famine coming on the land. God elevated Joseph through Pharaoh to become second in command over Egypt under Pharaoh. Joseph's main job was to prepare Egypt for the feast and famine. Everyone stored up a good portion of their food and provisions during the first seven years to avoid starvation across the land for the next seven years. Eventually, Jacob and his eleven sons were on the verge of starvation and had to go to Egypt to get food. They were humbled when they learned Joseph had become ruler over Egypt as second in command under Pharaoh. The brothers had to go before Joseph and repent for what they did before they could receive food. Jacob was also reintroduced to Joseph as well. We see seven years of feast and seven years of famine playing out again in the seven-year last trump. From 2017 until 2023, give or take a year, is the seven years of feast under President Trump. From 2024 to 2030, give or take a year, we will experience seven years of famine. I charted the years that way because it took about a year for the economy to kick into gear after President Trump was elected. So, the economy started picking up again mid-2017. I say this to be detailed because President Trump's two terms will equal eight years, not seven. So, 2017 until 2024 will encompass the seven years of feast. We have the Trump economy which is now the greatest economy in the world. When Trump became president, we saw the nationalism's rebirth happen in the United States. That means you represent your own nation and you work for your own nation's prosperity. God intended all of us to be divided into nations so we could be judged according to each nation. There are sheep nations and goat nations. Sheep nations, such as the United States, are considered favorable to God. Goat nations, like every Islamic nation in the world, are considered unfavorable to God. The average wealth and freedom of every person in these nations is a gauge of the overall wealth of the nation as a whole. In the 14 years Egypt experienced feast and then famine, Egypt was the only nation prepared for the famine compared to other nations around it. Is the United States our modern-day Egypt? Many people have made claims about how America parallels Egypt in many aspects. America's economy is moving lightning fast compared to every other economy on Earth. In fact, America's economy was rated the most competitive economy in the world in 2018. America is quickly recovering from the destructive Obama years, while the other economies around the world and other nations are trudging along. God is returning all the seeds America has sown in other countries back to America. God is making other nations pay back money through one deal or another. The United States will be the main outreach for the gospel. These words were prophesied by Kim Clement, the same man who prophesied Trump's presidency and more. It's obvious now that God chose the United States to be the world headquarters for Christianity. God chose this nation to do his work, and the American people have the privilege of experiencing this level of favor and religious freedoms to do this blessed work. 
When the seven-year last Trump period is over, we could experience seven years of famine just as Egypt experienced after their seven years of feast were over. I believe this because there is a possibility that the Democrats can regain power by winning the 2024 elections. Hopefully, the United States will remain under Republican control after 2024 and become a safe haven from Christian and Jewish persecution during the tribulation to an extent. There is a chance, but highly unlikely. Egypt was prosperous because an anointed man of God built up the nation's reserves ahead of time. The United States has President Trump, who is the anointed man of God, building up America's reserves during these seven years of feast. Notice how God used the Gentile nation of Egypt to bless Jacob and all his sons? Jacob's twelve sons represent the twelve tribes of Israel. Modern-day America represents yesterday's Egypt and provides for the modern-day Israel. History repeats itself here. Egypt provided food and other provisions for Israel back then. Today, America is Israel's number one ally and provider of military protection and funding. During the seven years of famine, which will be the seven-year tribulation, the United States may be a nation of great support for Israel. Then, the United States provides provisions and protection for Israel during the seven years of famine. The Bible says the woman who gave birth to the man-child in Revelation 12 will be given wings of an eagle. She will go to the wilderness, and she will be protected. Revelation 12:14 states, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. Did John see America as this wilderness in his vision when he wrote this verse back in 90 AD? In 90 AD, America was all wilderness. John said the woman was given wings of an eagle. The national bird of the United States is the eagle. Will the United States assist the Jews at some point in this ordeal? Will the United States take a great number of Jews as refugees from this war with the Antichrist? Why would the world be in complete famine for seven years? I am making this prediction based on what is happening right now. President Trump can only stay in office for a maximum of eight years. There is a collection of celestial activities from 2017 to 2024 to mark the beginning and end of this time period. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53, the rapture will happen at the last trump. When we see the words last trump, we know it means more than just a trumpet blast in Israel. We know President Trump is a trumpet of God on earth. As President of the United States, Trump has the loudest voice and highest platform in the world. When he says and does something, the world hears it. If President Trump has the most influence, God will obviously use him. President Trump doesn't have to be a perfect Christian, because the world wouldn't listen to him if he was. He rules fairly between religions, just like King Cyrus did. If you and I were the President of the United States, we would use that platform to preach the gospel of Jesus in its purest form. We would condemn all other faiths in Jesus' name. That is why we are not in Trump's position. God needed someone who can be heard and accepted by all nations and religions. I believe God needs this last Trump to be heard around the world. At the end of 2024, I think we're going to see an incredible amount of change. This change is going to go one of two ways. Either we will see another leader who is like President Trump enter the White House, or we will see another leader who is worse than President Trump. If any Democrat becomes president, he or she could undo every good thing President Trump established for America's well-being over the last eight years. Those changes would happen with lightning speed. All citizens of non-nationalist countries will fight against global governments to achieve nationalism in some way, shape, or form. Think of the different realms of Earth affected by President Trump right now. He affects the economy, entertainment, religions, family, business, education, military activity, and more. His presidency has exposed corrupt governments, organizations, institutions, celebrities, political agendas, and satanic agendas. God knows all things, good and evil on earth. 
He is using President Trump to expose evil on earth. In the Bible, we see the voice of God sound almost like a great trumpet. The trumpet on top of Mount Sinai was loud and long when God spoke to Moses. Exodus 19.19 19 states, And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. When God spoke to John the Beloved in Revelation 4.1, John said the voice of Jesus sounded like a trumpet. Revelation 4.1 states, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as if it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. If Jesus is going to use anyone to speak to all nations, wouldn't it make sense that he used someone in the highest position of power? America has the greatest economy and military next to Israel on earth. There are other countries that have larger populations than America, but those countries don't have God. The United States only makes up 6% of the world's population, yet it is the greatest superpower on earth. The United States is a perfect parallel to Israel in the Bible because they were just a tiny percentage of the population of the earth as well. In the Bible, we see how God used a small army to fight in his name against armies that had great size. Judges 7.7 7 states, The Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the three hundred men who lapped and will give you the Midianites into your hands. So let all the other people go, each man to his home. God will be glorified in a small army's victory because all odds will be stacked against them. The small army's victory would be a sign to the enemy they defeated. It would also be a testimony to all other armies and kingdoms. This plays out many times with the Israelites on their journey to the Promised Land. That is how God works. He wants the world to know that he is in charge of all things. Satan, on the other hand, likes to show his power by having large armies. China has the largest army, and the red dragon is the symbol of the nation, which is how Satan is described in Revelation. Based on this, will China rule the world? All Islamic nations also contribute to Satan's army. That is why we see Israel is surrounded in the Gog of Magog war, according to Ezekiel. All nations around Israel are much larger compared to Israel's army. Those surrounding armies are all run by Islamic nations. Satan surrounded Israel with his armies. In the end, that was all by God's design. God allowed the Islamic region to grow until it overtook the original land of Israel and its surrounding regions. The original land of Israel used to be much larger than the sliver of land it occupies today. Israel is no larger than the state of Indiana, yet it used to be the size of Texas. For years, Muslims have chipped away at God's promised land. A lot is happening right now. Muslims are trying to destroy what is left of Israel, which is why God is using President Trump to shake things up and prepare the world for coming changes. God is using President Trump to warn the world that the seven-year tribulation is about to begin. Once President Trump's reign ends, the seven-year tribulation may begin. I believe this may happen. Could I be wrong? It is a possibility. The rapture and the tribulation could start in the middle of the last Trump period. I am trying to show you that the seven-year last Trump contains signs that point toward Jesus' return. I believe from 2017 until 2024, we may see the strongest outpouring of the Word of God. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. John 6.35 states, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The bread Jesus is speaking of in this verse is the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fills us with endless teachings, love, understanding of God, and more. Especially eternal life by the regeneration of our spirit. Jesus also refers to himself as the living water. John 4.14 4 states, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. During the seven years of feast, there is plenty of food and water. 
there is a shortage of food and water during the seven years of famine. That means we are in the seven years of feast now, and the seven years of famine will follow. The feast period we are in provides an abundance of affordable food, at least here in America. In fact, people are prepping for the impending famine now by stocking up. America already feeds and supports many nations. Egyptians, like Americans, consumed food like normal, but they also saved a lot of food. There is an abundant amount of food and other resources in America. The United States is the wealthiest country on earth with the most religious freedom, and this enables it to be the biggest supporter of Christian missionaries in other countries. If the seven years of feast ends in 2024 and the seven year tribulation begins, what will happen to America's Christian outreach to other nations? According to the Bible in the book of Genesis, Egypt was able to sustain the surrounding countries with the food they stored up during the seven years of feast. Will America be the final stand of Christianity on earth? Will only America supply food and financial support to the left behind Christians and their missions around the world? Only time will tell. The seven years of famine will be caused by hyperinflation of food prices among many other factors revealed in the Bible. Worldwide famine begins in the seven year tribulation when the black horse with the scales is released from the seals in the book of Revelation. Revelation 6, 5 through 6 states, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The famine will also point to the shortage of spiritual food as well. The word of God will no longer be shared at the same level it is now. People will no longer receive the abundant spiritual bread of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Salvation will only be earned in works, which will make it hard to get to Jesus. People may have to die as martyrs for Jesus in order to go to heaven. During the famine, globalism will take over the earth, possibly even the United States. In his 2019 State of the Union address, President Trump said the United States would never be a socialist nation. God gave President Trump great wisdom in dealing with the foolish globalist Democrats and Republicans. President Trump made complete fools out of the globalists during that speech, and he gained overwhelming support from Americans because of it. The late prophet Kim Clement also prophesied that God said America would never be a socialist nation. God spoke through both Kim Clement and President Trump. You will see the Communist Democratic Party try, but they will fail. When two or more agree in Jesus' name, it shall be established. Jesus also said, He is in the midst of them. Matthew 18.20 states, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The late prophet Kim Clement prophesied that America would weather a lot of tribulations. Will America be able to weather the seven-year tribulation? Has God lifted America up to a high place of favor for only a limited time? The Bible says the whole world will go against Israel. Does that also mean America will come against Israel too? I'm in good company when I say that America will attack Israel in a heartbeat if the Democrats ever gain power again. America has favor right now because it's Israel's number one ally. God told Abraham that he will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. Genesis 12.3 states, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Hopefully, America always remains an ally to Israel, but time will tell. Will the United States be a safe haven for Christians during the Antichrist's reign? The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, as well as Sodom and Gomorrah, creates a parallel. During Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction, Lot and his family were safe in a nearby city. Genesis 19.20 states, Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? A Christian community existed outside of Jerusalem, on the other side of the Jordan, that safely prospered while Jerusalem was surrounded and destroyed. 
I don't believe there will be a safe place from the Antichrist during the seven years of famine unless you are God's chosen Jews who will be taken into a place of protection. Jesus is our only hope of escaping the tribulation. We will see a large amount of victories during the seven-year last Trump period. It's a breath of fresh air to finally see this happening on behalf of God's people. We have witnessed a complete beatdown of the globalist agenda through President Trump. There is a parallel of this in the Bible. God used King Cyrus to overcome the globalist agenda of his day just like he's using President Trump today. King Cyrus and his armies overtook the whole world and freed the Israelites from Babylon so they could return to Jerusalem to build their second temple. In Isaiah 45, King Cyrus was prophesied to do just that. He was the unofficial ruler of the world at the time, just like President Trump is now. Isaiah 45, 1-4 states, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee, and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass, and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness, and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. The verse about King Cyrus was written by the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before Cyrus was born. Can you see the connection between this passage and the current situation with President Trump? This passage is recorded in Isaiah chapter 45. Donald Trump is the 45th President of the United States. The fact that the number 45 is represented with these two men has to be pointing at something prophetic taking place. I believe everything God did on behalf of King Cyrus in this chapter thousands of years ago, he is also currently doing on behalf of President Trump today. You should take the time right now to read that whole chapter and study it like I did. You will begin to understand what I am writing about here. Prophecies of the Last Trump the many words prophets have spoken about the last Trump is one of the greatest encouragements of the time. In this chapter, we will review a handful of well-known prophets who prophesied about this time and the leader of the free world who would be at the center. There are many people who disregard the words of prophets. I don't blame them because many false prophets have existed, like Jesus said they would. Matthew 24, 5 states, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. I once heard a preacher prophesy about the future. He used the exact words a satanic medium used on a YouTube video. Many people also ignorantly speak out based on a feeling they get. Obviously, those spirits are deceiving spirits. We see this played out in the Bible as well. 1 Kings 22.22 states, And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth, and do so. Jesus said there would be a lot of deception in the last days. We see this deception in media outlets. Before President Trump took office, most people did not realize the mainstream media spread misinformation. Most information the media has provided over the years was either a lie or a distorted truth. Because their lies have been exposed, one must wonder how many lies and false narratives we were told. God used President Trump to help Americans begin to question mainstream media. Even I was unaware of how deep the lies went. I knew media twisted the truth to get better ratings, but the level of its twisting is so great now that it has led news outlets to put out complete lies. Mainstream media is the platform of the devil, also known as Leviathan. The Bible refers to Leviathan as a crooked serpent. Some translations even use twisting. Isaiah 27.1 states, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Isaiah 27.1, World English Version, states, In that day Yahweh, with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, 
the fleeing serpent, and Leviathan the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon that is in the sea. The serpent will always twist the truth for his agenda. The serpent distorted the truth to get Eve to eat fruit from the tree of knowledge and then share it with Adam. The spirit of that serpent is heavily ingrained in our mainstream media. That is why we must watch Christian news outlets to get the truth. My mother-in-law always worked herself up. She was scared of all the information about President Trump that she received from mainstream media. The Democrats are constantly pursuing different avenues to impeach President Trump. I told her to stop watching those news stations and turn to conservative outlets, especially Christian ones, because these channels have a no-Satan policy. The devil can't twist any truths on these channels. Job 41.1 states, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down? Job 41.1 Living Bible states, Can you catch a crocodile with a hook and line, or put a noose around his tongue? Crocodile hunting habits are similar to those of the Leviathan. Crocodiles hide under water for long periods of time and examining prey before making a sneak attack. Crocodiles have long mouths with hundreds of sharp teeth. They do not have molars to grind food. Instead, crocodiles bite down onto their prey and twist their own body around to rip the flesh from it. They twist to kill their prey, just as the mainstream, deep state-controlled media twists the truth to further their globalist agenda. Crocodiles' mouths make up a third of their bodies. Just as the crocodile hides under water, mainstream media hides in a sea of wicked people. Mainstream media's collective voice is its weapon just as the crocodile's mouth is its weapon. For example, the Pharisees and the Sadducees unknowingly twisted the truth when Jesus said he would tear the temple down and rebuild it in three days. They ran with that one. Jesus was not talking about the temple of Herod. He was referring to the temple of the body. Like President Trump, Jesus directly spoke against the Pharisees and scribes false information. Outside of all the wicked actions they took in, they also preached the traditions of men. They imposed the law of Moses, as well as their heavenly twisted traditions on people. Yet, the Pharisees and scribes would not follow those rules themselves. We now see the same spirit of oppression in America and around the world when leadership says, Do as I say, but not as I do. Rules for thee and not for me. A two-tier justice system exists in America and other nations. The ruling elite and their minions can break the same laws you and I can, yet the elites are not punished for it. For that reason alone, I want to see Jesus come back and put an end to the filth. There is an overabundance of lawlessness today as the Bible foretold. There is also an immense amount of deception in these last days. In fact, it is the first thing Jesus said we should look for regarding his second coming. When the disciples of Jesus asked him about what to look for as a sign of his coming, Jesus first addressed deception in the last days. When it comes to hearing the words of the prophets, it can be a little tricky. That is why we need the Holy Spirit's discernment and understanding about the Word of God. If a prophet comes along and says your 88-year-old grandmother is going to give birth to a male child who will rule a nation, you know you're dealing with a false prophet. The prophets I'm going to present to you in this book all gave similar prophecies about Donald Trump and when he will fulfill these prophecies. These men only represent a few of the prophets who have spoken about the age of Donald Trump. There are many other lesser-known prophets who spoke the same words. According to the Bible, in the mouth of two or three witnesses may every word be established. The Bible also says when two or more agree in Jesus' name, it shall be done. 2 Corinthians 13.1 states, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. The first prophet I want to tell you about prophesied a two-term presidency for Trump. This prophet was accurate about President Trump and what God was going to use him for. Here is some information about the late prophet Kim Clement. From NewsReleaseToday.com Kim Clement was born in South Africa on September 30, 1956. From 1976 to 1978, he was a pastor of music and youth ministry, pastor at various churches. 
During that time, Kim worked as a counselor in a drug rehabilitation center. He also worked with mentally handicapped children, assisting in their coordination by teaching music. In 1978, Kim married Jane Elizabeth Barnes. They were together 30 years and had five children. In 1991, Kim and his family moved to the United States. After years of travel and ministering, Kim moved to Detroit and started the Warriors of the New Millennium, which was an outreach for wounded people within the city and eventually throughout the United States. At one point, Kim also lived in California and ran Secrets, a prophetic outreach. According to an announcement by Kim's family, the prophet died on November 24, 2016, after suffering from a brain bleed and other medical complications for more than a year. He was 60 years old. This is Kim's prophecy about Donald Trump from 2007. I am God, and you have called to me, and many from this nation have said, Enough! Enough of religion, and enough of dead speech. The Spirit of God said, This is a moment of resurrection. For the Spirit of God says, Honor me with your praise and acceptance of this that I say to you. This that shall take place shall be the most unusual thing, a transfiguration, a going into the marketplace, if you wish, and into the news media, where Time magazine will have no choice but to say what I want them to say. Newsweek, what I want them to say. And The View, what I want to say. Trump shall become a trumpet, says the Lord. I will raise up the Trump to become a trumpet, and Bill Gates to open up the gate of a financial realm for the church, says the Spirit of the living God. God's Spirit says, I am waiting. I am waiting for the response from my people throughout this land. Can somebody see victory? Can somebody see honor? For God says, let me remind you, I will place at your helm a president that shall pray to me, says the Lord. He will pray to me. And God says, in the next two terms, there will be a praying president, not a religious one. For I will fool the people, says the Lord. I will fool the people, yes, I will. God says, the one that is chosen shall go in, and they shall say, he has hot blood. For the Spirit, God says, yes, he may have hot blood. But he will bring the walls of protection on this country in a greater way, and the economy of this country shall change rapidly, says the Lord of hosts. God says, I will put at your helm for two terms a president that will pray, but he will not be a praying president when he starts. I will put him in office, and then I will baptize him with the Holy Spirit and my power, says the Lord of hosts. In 1967, there was a great revolution, but God said, the revolution that you are going to experience starting in 2007 is going to be greater than anything that's ever happened. The Spirit of the Lord says, Hear the word of the Lord tonight. This nation has waited and waited, and they have said, Revival, revival, revival. God said, There is more than revival. We have revived and brought back, but a spirit of resurrection is upon you. For God said, I am breathing. I am breathing upon the people of this nation. I am breathing upon the churches that are going down and I am bringing them up, says the Spirit of God. I am breathing upon the political powers that be, for God said, I will not forget 9-11. I will not forget what took place that day, and I will not forget the gatekeeper that watched over New York, who will once again stand and watch over this nation, says the Spirit of God. It shall come to pass that the man that I place in the highest office shall go in whispering my name, but God said, when he enters into the office, he will be shouting out by the power of the Spirit, for I shall fill him with my Spirit, when he goes into office, and there will be a praying man in the highest seat in your land. And God says, even a greater move of the Spirit shall take place, and your enemies will finally be subdued by the year 2009. The Spirit of God says, Where you are, lift up your eyes, and whatever you see tonight, I'm going to give it to you. For your sight has been elevated, says the Lord. America, America, you are the salt of the earth. America, America, you are the light of the world. The Spirit of God says, 
As you sing these words, surely I will remember the promises that were made on the steps of the capital. Though now abandoned and though now forgotten, God says, I will not forget, and I will bring to this nation what it deserves. For in 2009 you will say, This is the beginning, and will never end. Therefore rejoice, for whatever you see tonight, I will give it to you, says the Spirit of God. America, America, you are the salt of the earth. America, America, you are the light of the world. The next prophet I want to share with you that prophesied about Trump is named Rich Vera. He is known worldwide just like Kim Clement. A movie even came out about Rich's life. He is a well-known evangelist of the gospel. He too prophesied Trump's coming before 2016. Rich prophesied the historic good works President Trump would accomplish in America. He also prophesied that prosperity would return to America. Rich Vera prophesied that a great awakening would take place in America and then go forth throughout the world. The great awakening started with the election of Donald Trump. God used this election as a trumpet alarm sound to start waking up America and then the whole world. This alarm is now sounding throughout the earth in the form of nationalism. Definition of Nationalism Identification with one's own nation and support for its interests, especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. Nationalism is the opposite of globalism. Definition of Globalism The operation or planning of economic and foreign policies on a global basis. I would like to take a moment to go off topic to identify what globalism and nationalism means to God and Satan. Globalism is the agenda pursued by Satan to bring the whole world into unity. He needs this to happen so the whole world will worship him and operate in only his ways. This world unity almost happened at the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis. The Bible says they were all united in one voice. This is why God had to intervene and mix up the languages of all people at this time. Everyone on earth was forced to divide into nations. Then all these nations went their separate ways to establish themselves in their own lands throughout the world. Satan's global rule attempt almost succeeded at the Tower of Babel, but God defeated him by creating nationalism. God created nationalism by separating all the humans on earth into different nations. Since this event, Satan has been trying to reunite the world. This is why we see such a strong movement of globalism today. Satan will eventually succeed with globalism. Globalism won't happen until after the rapture resurrection. The seven-year tribulation is seven years of Satan's globalism on the earth. The seven-year tribulation is so horrific that even Jesus said it will be a time like never before and never again. Matthew 24, 21 states, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. A one-world order sounds like a good thing, but it's not. In heaven there is a one-world order because we who are saved through Jesus Christ are one with God. John 14.20 states, At that day ye shall know that I am the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. While we are here on earth, God wants us divided into separate nations because we come together as a global unit. We start to do ungodly things. That is just the way it is for now because Satan is the god of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4 states, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Globalism activity is a guaranteed indicator that Satan is the head of this movement currently on the earth. Satan's globalist rule will eventually come to an end with the return of Christ to set up his kingdom on earth. Jesus will cast Satan and his entire kingdom of globalist people into hell. They will be locked away in there during his reign on the earth. Jesus will establish his one world order for the next 1,000 years. I will now get back on topic with the next prophet who prophesied the coming of Donald Trump, Rich Vera. In the early days of Rich Vera's ministry, God led him to go on a 21-day fast. 
During that time, God took Rich in spirit to the White House. Rich watched White House operations for eight hours straight. That happened while Obama served as president. Rich saw 12 rich elite people run the country and the world from the White House. He watched them use money to manipulate other nations' economics. He also saw how the elite, to an extent, controlled free speech. The elite controlled what the president said and the information that came out of the White House. God told Rich he was going to change everything in the White House. God said he would appoint men and women of God who would do his will. The new president would say what God wanted them to say. It sounds to me that this came to pass when Trump was elected president. The 12 world elite cannot stand President Trump. He is greatly messing with their money and world power. The elite fought President Trump by raising the interest rate seven times in the first two years Trump was in office. There was no need to raise interest rates because the economy was doing well. They were trying to dethrone Trump. Obviously, President Trump will not do the will of the global elite. In Rich's prophecy, President Trump does the will of God. Long before 2016, Rich saw Trump become the President of the United States. He knew God would lift Trump to that position. As the president moved higher, the enemy shot arrows at him, but the arrows were not able to reach him. God made it clear that because his servants and his prophets did not raise up and speak his will into the nation, he would raise up Donald Trump to do this work. He would cause Trump to sound like a trumpet. Trump has been heard around the world. His words have caused citizens of many communist and Sharia law-controlled nations to rise up against their satanic leadership. Globalist governments want to see Trump removed from office one way or another, but they can't get near him. The media is against President Trump, but they won't prevail. The rich watched masses of people wake up because of Trump's voice. They woke up and looked to God. These people will begin to take their places in the positions of authority in America and around the world. I believe God wants world governments to be able to execute his will during the seven-year last Trump. Many nations are becoming nationalist nations and turning away from globalism. God is always victorious. The worldwide nationalist movement was initiated because God used President Trump's voice to call out to the world and say it's okay not to be unified on earth. Rich knew that Trump was unstoppable because of an angel of the Lord went before him in all things. He knew Trump would move into a season of his life in which God would remember him and the prayers that had been prayed for him. God will move to save President Trump's soul. Next, President Trump will make a public confession that Christ is his personal Lord and Savior. Rich saw the world elite and liberal left tremble with fear every time Donald Trump spoke in his visions. The globalists know a time of reformation was coming. That is taking place right now. President Trump will expose the wickedness of the world. The bride of Christ will increase her voice of condemnation on all wicked things. Since President Trump took office, the Christians have grown bolder in their stand against wickedness. Their voice will be heard by wicked governments and people of the world. Rich saw this period of righteousness and justice coming. All evil people will answer for their unjust works. Rich Vera saw an age of victory for the righteous and an eye-opening awareness of wickedness to the masses worldwide. Since Trump's election, we have seen a great rival of God across the earth that continues till this day. I believe that Rich saw the seven-year last Trump period. Next, we have Mark Taylor, who wrote the Trump Prophecy. Jesus visited Mark, and he was shown that an angel of the Lord would be assigned to him and would lead him to speak and write down prophetic words. You can read about his prophecies pertaining to President Trump in his book. Mark wrote that prophecy when he was bedridden with sickness. I read Mark's book, and it is very encouraging. Mark was visited by the Spirit of the Lord. He received a message that Donald Trump would become President of the United States. Mark says that God is not going to pass judgment on the United States right now. 
If he wanted to do that, Hillary Clinton would have become president. Instead, God made Donald Trump president because he will take America on a path toward new prosperity. There will be some issues along the way since there are still evil people in our government. For example, the Democrats have tried to slow down America's prosperity. Even with their evil works, President Trump's economy is still the greatest economy in American history. Imagine if the Democrats couldn't get in the way. They haven't done one good thing for America since the 2016 elections. They are focused on attacking the president and other conservatives. Our tax dollars pay their salaries so they can make America a better place, not fight Republicans. I believe God will eventually do away with all Democrats. Mark's prophecy stated that God would recharge America's prosperity so it could be used to spread the gospel one more time, in the biggest way ever, before the end. In order for that to happen, America needed a president who would do God's will. One of God's main purposes with Trump is to use him to drain the swamp in Washington. I believe numerous arrests and political position shutdowns will take place after the 2020 election. This is why I believe the Democrats are so desperately trying to have Trump impeached. They know they can't beat him in the 2020 elections. I also personally believe and hope that the Democrats who operate against our Constitution and commit treasonous acts will be locked up in prison after the 2020 elections. I believe this is a greater reason why the Democrats are pulling all the stops to get Trump out of office. Mark Taylor continues to speak today about mass arrests that will take place in Washington and worldwide after Trump wins the 2020 elections. I personally believe that 2020 will mark the permanent shutdown of the Democratic Party. Prophet Kim Clement prophesied that there is a new righteous party that will arise at this time. Will this party be the permanent replacement of the demonic Democratic Party? I can only hope. Mark also wrote another prophecy called Energy. That prophecy supports the United States and Israel becoming the top two energy producers in the world. Mark was accurate with that prophecy. During President Trump's first term, the United States joined Israel in the top position for energy production. More details about these prophecies exist in Mark's book. The link to his website where you can access his book can be found at the end of this book. The Ancient Last Trump Protocol I want to share some biblical examples that mirror the last Trump period protocol. I would like to start with Noah and the Ark. Genesis 7.4 states, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. The Bible jumps back and forth between periods of seven days and seven years. Daniel's 70th week is a period of seven years, also known as the seven-year tribulation. Daniel's 70th week is not a period of seven days like the week we are used to. On the flip side, we read about Noah waiting in the ark for seven 24-hour days for the flood to take place. Genesis 7.11 states, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day we were all fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. How does this apply to us today? I believe we are currently waiting in the ark of Jesus Christ, during our own period of seven, like Noah and his family did. They waited for seven days, and we are waiting for seven years. Do you see the parallel? I call this seven-year period the last Trump period. To clarify, the flood of Noah wasn't a constant rain. God caused the earth to open up, and the flood waters came up like geysers. The flood took place in about a day or so. After completing the ark, Noah and his family lived in it for seven days before the flood came. Noah received a seven-day time frame for a peaceful preparation. During that time, Noah didn't have to work on the ark because it was already built. Our ark is the throne of Jesus Christ, the ark of the covenant. His throne represents the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Acts 7.55 states, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. The Ark of the Covenant was built by the Israelites as a copy of God's throne. 
The great boat that God built through Noah is labeled the Ark. God's throne on earth was labeled the Ark. All earthly thrones sank except for God's. Jesus said he would never leave or forsake us. Hebrews 13.5 states, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Does that mean we won't see tribulation here on earth? No. Jesus meant that he would never take away his gift of salvation. It also means he will never leave us here on earth, completely forsaken to experience his wrath during the seven-year tribulation. He will catch us up from earth before the seven-year tribulation takes place. Jesus sits on the ark in heaven, which is his throne. We are heirs to the benefits of his throne. We inherit the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Romans 8.17 states, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You can now see God's throne is similar to an ark of safety for us. Noah had an ark of safety here on earth. Noah's ark was a boat, and Jesus is our ark. Noah was safe in God's promise, which manifested as an ark for the duration of God's wrath. We are safe today in God's promise through the manifestation of Jesus Christ. The Bible says God will shorten days for the elect's sake. Could that mean all events and timelines are shortened from a particular point? It is truly a mystery and proof that no one knows the day or hour. Can all my research here pinpoint the exact day of the rapture or when the tribulation begins? No. But we can know the season. I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are in a unique seven-year season until 2024, because it parallels Noah's seven-day waiting period. Jesus said, As in the days of Noah, so shall it be, in the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24, 37-39 states, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That means that whatever happened at the time of the flood, the same will happen now. Get ready. Our Savior is coming soon to take us away to a place of safety during this time of God's wrath. I want to share an interesting parallel to the seven-year last Trump protocol, which took place almost 2,000 years ago during the ministry of Jesus Christ and continued for four years after his ascension. That last Trump period was slightly different than the one we are in now. Today we are in a seven-year time frame that possibly marks the end of dispensation and the beginning of another. The last Trump period possibly marks the end of the Age of Grace and the beginning of the Seven-Year Tribulation. I believe this unique seven-year period took place in the past from 30 to 37 AD, give or take a year. This seven-year period took place at the end of the Dispensation of the Law of Moses and at the beginning of the Dispensation of Grace. The Age of Grace is known as the Ecclesiastical Age or the Age of the Church. Check out the timeline graph in the infographic section of this book, which lays out all the dispensations of time in the Bible. In 30 AD, Jesus launched his three-and-a-half-year ministry. Here is the breakdown of that period. In 30 AD, John the Baptist preached about the Messiah who would be coming. John the Baptist was the greatest prophet up to that point, according to Jesus. Matthew 11.11 11 states, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding that he is least in the kingdom of heaven, is greater than he. John the Baptist was the greatest prophet because he was the final one and announced Jesus Christ was coming. John the Baptist was the son of an elderly Jewish woman named Elizabeth, and his father was Zechariah. In Luke 1, 5-25, the angel Gabriel came unto Zechariah the year he served as high priest. Zechariah was in the temple of the Holy of Holies. He was in the midst of the ark doing his priestly duties at Passover. An angel appeared and told him he would have a son with his wife Elizabeth. At that time, Zechariah was of elderly age along with his wife. 
When the angel Gabriel told Zechariah that he and his wife would have a son and to name him John, he verbally professed his unbelief. Gabriel took away Zechariah's ability to speak until John was born. That seems like a harsh punishment for not believing in God's ability to perform miracles. There are also great rewards when we believe in God's miracles. We cannot have salvation through Jesus Christ unless we truly believe in his finished works. Belief is the same as faith. The Bible says God is not moved by our needs, only by our faith. The Bible says Enoch was taken alive to heaven in a rapture event because he had faith. Noah was spared from the wrath of God because he had faith. In the same way, we will survive the wrath of God because of our faith. The rapture is a blessing from God we receive by faith. Enoch received the rapture blessing because of his faith in it. Hebrews 11.15 states, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. The promise of the rapture is a blessing to all believers in Jesus on earth that have faith in this event. We receive this understanding through reading the word of God. We received an understanding of this revelation through dreams, visions, near-death experiences, and even messages from angels. As crazy as the rapture may sound, if we don't have faith, we can't partake. Many laugh at that concept or don't believe it. They also laughed and condemned Noah as he built the ark. People also laughed at and condemned Jesus for his prophecies. 2 Peter 3.3 3 states, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. When John the Baptist started preaching, he said some profound things. He said everyone needed to repent for their sins and be baptized as preparation for the coming of the Lord. He spoke about the coming of the ministry of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist spoke about the man who baptized with fire, while he can only baptize with water. John also said that he wasn't even worthy to loosen the straps of Jesus' sandals. John 127 states, He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. I believe the seven-year last Trump period we are in right now also took place from 30 to 37 A.D., give or take a year. John the Baptist baptized Jesus, and then his ministry began to decrease as Jesus' ministry increased. Jesus had a three-and-a-half-year ministry ending in the middle of 33 A.D. John the Baptist preached a message of repentance by baptism. He baptized Jesus. Then Jesus practiced his own ministry. Jesus succeeded in his ministry, which ended with his death, burial, and resurrection. Over the next three and a half years, the apostles preached the gospel to the Jews, and it wasn't until 37 AD that the apostle Paul delivered the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. Acts 9.15 states, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. 1 Timothy 1.15 states, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. In 1 Timothy 1.15, our Apostle Paul called himself a chief. Why would he call himself a chief in this passage? Chief in the Bible means first. Paul was saying that he was the first to be saved into the body of Christ. Paul was the first to preach the actual gospel of grace, not the original apostles. The original apostles were preaching the coming kingdom for the Jews on the earth during the thousand-year reign of Christ. Their gospel consists of faith in Jesus and good works. The Jews' eternal home is on the earth, but our eternal home is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 5.1 states, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we would have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Peter also spoke of humans dwelling both on the earth and in the heavens. Peter 3.13 states, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness.
Through his miraculous conversion, preaching, and writings, Paul proved himself to be the apostle for the Gentiles. Peter and some of the other disciples preached the gospel of faith and works to some Gentiles. When the Lord led the apostle Paul to preach only to the Gentiles, salvation through Jesus completely opened to the Gentile world. Paul was the actual replacement for Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. The apostles drew lots to finally decide on Matthias to be the twelfth apostle, but God had already chosen Judas's replacement. Ananias received a vision from the Lord informing him that Paul was chosen to preach to the Gentile world. Acts 9.22 states, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. How do I know Matthias was not a true apostle chosen by God? His works are never mentioned in the Bible. God obviously did not honor the apostles' lots to initiate Matthias into apostleship. God had already chosen Saul, who became Paul, as his apostle. Saul, who became Paul, was a fitting choice by God to change the hearts of unbelievers because he was the biggest persecutor of Christians in that day, and then became the biggest supporter. When people heard of his conversion, they knew it could only happen through God's intervention. God made Paul the mouthpiece of Christianity in that day. God can cause 180 degree turns in the hearts and minds of people. Only God can change a man's direction as drastically as he did Paul's. God turned Paul's direction so dramatically that Paul was willing to die for the same faith he persecuted. Through his preaching and letters, Paul launched the Age of Grace. We see from 30 AD to 37 AD the makings of a seven-year period of events. This period of events, I believe, was the seven-year last Trump period for this time in history. This period covered the transition from the dispensation of the Age of Law all the way to the dispensation of the Age of Grace we live in today. We must look at a seven-year period from the beginning to the end. John the Baptist came in the beginning, Jesus came in the middle, and Paul came at the end. Those three men and their works announced the end of the Age of Law and the beginning of the Age of Grace to the world. The seven-year last trump announces the end of the Age of Grace and the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. I want to point something out about the similarities between these two seven-year periods. In the middle of the last trump, almost 2,000 years ago, a resurrection and rapture event took place. Jesus was resurrected in 33 AD. The dead were also resurrected during Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Shortly after, the apostles watched Jesus ascend into heaven. Acts 1.9 states, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. The ascension of Jesus into heaven in Acts 1.9 was a rapture event. We know Jesus was immortal before he ascended to heaven. I often wonder if that gives us a clue about what will happen with us at the rapture. Are we changed into our glorified bodies and then taken up into the clouds? Time will tell. Amen? Closing Comments Thank you for reading this book. I provided a lot of information for you to take in, so I do recommend going back and rereading it. I recommend that you take my research and compare it to the Bible. Do your own research. I may be in error in some places. None of us have this all figured out, but we all strive to become better informed about what the Word of God tells us. 2 Timothy 2.15 states, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As far as what will actually happen over the next five to ten years, none of us know for sure. Everything I have provided for you in this book are strictly my theory and predictions. I say this because God is sovereign. He can do anything He wants. The biblical seven-year tribulation may not happen at the time displayed on this chart. There may be another president after Donald Trump, named Trump, perhaps one of his children. Donald Trump may be the first of a Trump presidential dynasty of the United States. One of Donald Trump's children may be the last Trump to hold office. 
hence the last trump. Every one of us has a little piece to the puzzle. The piece of the puzzle I'm giving to you right now is identifying the time frame we are currently living in. I don't need to tell you these things are happening around the world that point toward Jesus' return. If you are reading this book, the chances are that you are a student of the biblical end times and you are well aware of the condition of the earth. The seven-year last trump is the accumulation of my research on the signs and events happening within a unique time frame. This unique time frame contains key components like the timing of Donald Trump's presidency, accompanied by the words, the last trump, which is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. Those verses contain key rapture and resurrection word components that are trigger points. We know that this dispensation period of grace ends with the rapture and resurrection. Isn't that what we are all ultimately looking for? I am working on the sequel to this book. There is still so much information to unpack about this topic. I also recommend you visit my YouTube channel. I have many videos about the seven-year last Trump that also show pictures and graphs to better help you understand the material in this book. I also have more videos coming out about this topic. Please share this book with your friends and family, especially those who don't believe. They will be shocked because many of them are familiar with the celestial and earthly signs of the end times. I also recommend buying this book and donating it to a prison. That is one of the main reasons I wrote this book. I want people who don't have access to the internet to be able to access this time-sensitive and vital information. People may not read the Bible, but they will get a good feeling of it here. Many polls showed people are interested in the end times, but don't know how to extract the information from the Bible. This book makes that possible. You can find copies of this book at Amazon.com and bookstores. You may also find this book at our official website, www.edvforme.org, along with more updated content about the last Trump awakening period. End Time Dream and Vision Look for more content like this on our YouTube channel, End Time Dream and Vision, or just search Bob Barber. For more on Mark Taylor and his book, go to his website, www.swordrescue.com. About Bob Barber I am a Christian and proud of it. I am a born-again believer of Jesus Christ. God has led me and facilitated my growth over the years so I could become a very unique teacher of his word. God has established a well-known social media presence for me. I am the CEO and president of a very successful nonprofit company called Feed My Sheep Today. The company's only goal is to support the expansion of God's kingdom worldwide. We do that by raising money to support Christian missions. Through them, we share the message of hope and Jesus' love. We also provide free Bibles and humanitarian relief aid. You can find us at www.feedmysheeptoday.org. I was born in 1975 and raised in Munster, Indiana. I went to St. Thomas More Grade School. Then I went to Munster High School where I played varsity basketball and graduated in 1994. From there I went to Purdue University and pursued a business degree. I met my beautiful wife in 1996 and we were married five years later. We have been happily married ever since. God had provided us with a beautiful home that we still live in today in Dyer, Indiana, with our two sons, ages 10 and 12. Both of my sons are incredibly talented and wonderful children. I thank God for my whole family every day. I thank God most of all for our salvation through Him, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have also run a very successful YouTube channel since 2013. I share the Word of God by interpreting my subscribers' dreams and visions. I also recreate these dreams through different forms of animation so others can watch and be encouraged. I also speak on many other biblical topics, especially the seven-year last Trump period. Just search End Time Dream and Vision or Bob Barber on YouTube. You can also find our videos and other content at our website, www.edvforme.org. Dedication First, I would like to acknowledge my Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, who used the Holy Spirit to lead me to write this book. I want to acknowledge my mother for bringing me up in a Christian household. Thanks, Mom.
I want to acknowledge my wonderful wife, Erin, for being by my side for more than half of my life, and for giving me two incredible sons whom I can pass my knowledge to about this subject. I want to thank my wife for being an incredible spouse, mother, and partner in all aspects of my life, especially serving our Lord in this ministry. I want to acknowledge every single watchman on the wall, like myself, who are currently sounding the alarm about our Savior's return on various platforms around the world. Last, but certainly not least, I would like to acknowledge my greatest brother in the Lord, Apostle Larry Shelby. I have learned a great deal from him since the inception of our friendship over a decade ago, which made me ready for this ministry and writing this book. Proverbs 27.17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So I give great thanks to him and to all above who have played a significant part in my life and this ministry. Closing Comments Thank you for listening to this audiobook. I provided a lot of information for you to take in. I recommend that you take my research and compare it to the Bible. Do your own research. I may be in error in some places. None of us have this all figured out, but we all strive to become better informed about what the Word of God tells us. 2 Timothy 2.15 states, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. As far as what will actually happen over the next five to ten years, none of us know for sure. Everything I have provided for you in this book are strictly my theory and predictions. I say this because God is sovereign. He can do anything He wants. The biblical seven-year tribulation may not happen at the time displayed on this chart. There may be another president after Donald Trump, named Trump, perhaps one of his children. Donald Trump may be the first of a Trump presidential dynasty of the United States. One of Donald Trump's children may be the last Trump to hold office, hence the last Trump. Every one of us has a little piece to the puzzle. The piece of the puzzle I'm giving to you right now is identifying the time frame we are currently living in. I don't need to tell you these things are happening around the world that point toward Jesus' return. If you are reading this book, the chances are that you are a student of the biblical end times and you are well aware of the condition of the earth. The seven-year last trump is the accumulation of my research on the signs and events happening within a unique time frame. This unique time frame contains key components like the timing of Donald Trump's presidency accompanied by the words, the last trump, which is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. Those verses contain key rapture and resurrection word components that are trigger points. We know that this dispensation period of grace ends with the rapture and resurrection. Isn't that what we are all ultimately looking for? I am working on the sequel to this book. There is still so much information to unpack about this topic. I also recommend you visit my YouTube channel. I have many videos about the seven-year last Trump that also show pictures and graphs to better help you understand the material in this book. I also have more videos coming out about this topic. Please share this book with your friends and family, especially those who don't believe. They will be shocked because many of them are familiar with the celestial and earthly signs of the end times. I also recommend buying this book and donating it to a prison. That is one of the main reasons I wrote this book. I want people who don't have access to the internet to be able to access this time-sensitive and vital information. People may not read the Bible, but they will get a good feeling of it here. Many polls showed people are interested in the end times, but don't know how to extract the information from the Bible. This book makes that possible. You can find copies of this book at Amazon.com and bookstores. You may also find this book at our official website, www.edvforme.org, along with more updated content about the last Trump awakening period. End Time Dream and Vision Look for more content like this on our YouTube channel, End Time Dream and Vision, or just search Bob Barber. For more on Mark Taylor and his book, go to his website, www.swordrescue.com. This completes the audiobook of The Road to 2024, God's Final Declaration Heralding the Seven-Year Tribulation, by Bob Barber. 
Thanks for listening.